Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Unstereotype Alliance Global Member Summit of 2022. My name is Jess Wiener. I'm the founder and CEO of Talk to Jess. I've been an entrepreneur for about 30 years now, and I've worked at the intersection of social change and social impact in helping brands create more representation in their media, marketing, advertising, and workforce. And many of those partners are here today as members of the Unstereotype Alliance with a special love and shout out to my partners at Unilever for the past 18 years. I was a part of the Dove Campaign for Real Beauty launch in 2004. We helped to change Barbie's body, uh, which is incredible. If you don't know now, Barbie has lots of different body shapes and sizes, skin tones, hair textures, and eye shapes. And of course, my partners at American Eagle and Aerie, where we've been focusing on no retouching and no Photoshopping since 2014. So I am incredibly happy to be here today. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to our first face-to-face -face summit since 2019, and um, we wanted to open the doors a little wider this morning in our opening plenary session, um, and we wanted to share a little bit more about the mission of our work, and to be quite frank and candid, why now more than ever it is so important for us to focus the next two days on the theme of raising the bar. And you'll soon hear more about why we're committed to eliminating harmful stereotypes from advertising and media content in an effort to create a more equal world. I'm gonna be sharing MC and hosting duties with the incredible head of the Unstereotype Alliance, my friend Sarah Denby. But as I'm up first, it's my privilege to welcome you to the UN headquarters in New York City, and I'm gonna run you through a few house rules. So first up, if you're speaking today and you want to move a little bit closer into these horseshoe seats just to make sure you're close enough to the stage, that's a call for our speakers to consider. There is a QR code inside of your lanyard on back of the credentials that also contains the schedule for today if you want to access that. And uh, for all my folks in perimenopause, this is an important conversation. We're going to be sitting here together for the next three hours. So if you need to use the restrooms, <laughs> they are located at the top of the stairs, which is the only way to exit this ECOSOC chamber. Uh, and we do not have access to the second floor, just as a reminder. So if you need some help, we're hoping there will be some friendly ushers out there to help guide you to the de destinations you need to go to. Um, please don't lose your pass. Really important that you keep your credentials close to you with your identification documents and of course there's no smoking prohibited in the building and food and drink is not permitted inside this chamber. So while we're inside the ECOSOC chamber you all have ear shells near you if you want to put those on to hear a little bit better that's what they're there for and ear shells is my new favorite term. Um, and your microphones have been disabled, not because we don't want to hear you speak, but we want to minimize the chaos in the room and make sure that we're focused here on the folks in front of the room or at the dais presenting today. And of course, because COVID is still with us, if you start to feel unwell during our time together, please do make your way out and let an usher know. And of course, if you happen to test positive uh, after the summit, please also let us know. For those of you who are joining us only for the plenary session this morning, Please don't forget to stop in the lobby and take those amazing selfie pictures. We're going to put up the tags, I think, for everybody right now. Um, and please tag the Unstereotype Alliance. And for our members, do not fear. We have plenty of selfie opportunities coming upstairs. And then finally, hello to everybody watching this morning on our live stream on UN TV and on UN Women's YouTube channel. The cameras, not to worry, are focused up here on the speakers today. And you'll be able to watch this event and send the link to your colleagues afterwards and we'll be providing closed captioning. And with that, all of the house rules and formalities are out of the way, so let's move on with the program. It is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce UN Women's Director of Strategic Partnerships, Mr. Dan Seymour, and he's going to welcome you on behalf of the United Nations. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jess. And, and it is a great pleasure. Uh, to welcome you on behalf of the UN in, in this very special place. But let me do some formal salutations, first of all, to uh, my colleague Anita Bhatia, Assistant Secretary General from UN Women, our Deputy Vice Chairs uh, of the Unstereotype Alliance, I think you know many of them, Alini Santos, uh, Heide Gardner, Dale Green, welcome all of you. The global members of the Unstereotype Alliance, our national chapter members from 12 countries and growing, uh, members of the diplomatic family that are here. We're very pleased you're joining us, and I know more are coming over, over the course of the next couple of days. Members of the media, 
members of the public, uh, our advocates, our friends, uh, colleagues and, and, and guests, particularly those joining us online. I want to welcome all of you here to this Unstereotype Alliance Global Member Summit 2022. Uh, I remember when we had to cancel this event um, because of COVID a couple of years ago. It was, uh, it was an enormously wrenching and, and, and sad thing to have to do, which makes today even, even sweeter. I was asked to, uh, to, to find a little space to apologize for the state of the chairs. Uh, please do uh, forgive us. I, I actually, surprisingly, it turns out that if you go online, you will discover uh, a document about this. It's that, it's that much of, a, of an issue for the world. Uh, a very kind member state um, offered to replace the upholstery. It obviously turns out not to have been necessarily the best choice, I suspect. Um, but anyway, please do forgive us. But let that not detract from the fact that we are here in the, the ECOSOC chamber, the Economic and Social Council uh, chamber. And in this room, for almost 80 years, the world has come together. Uh, to make progress on the issues that matter. There is history here with us. If there is a seat for the world where the human family comes together to tackle the really big issues that matter most to people, the fight against poverty, ending hunger, ensuring a decent education for all children, wherever they live, whoever they are, making sure everyone has access to clean water, sanitation, all of these things have been driven from where we are sitting right now, and I think there couldn't be a more appropriate space for us to spend the next couple of days with the mission that we share. A little more than five years ago, a group of partners came together in Cannes, and they shared a very simple idea that advertising could be a force for good, but that too often, advertising had become a force for stereotype prejudice and discrimination. And they believed that Adland could come together to change itself uh, and thereby change the world. And I see some of those, those founders here, and it's great to see you, see you all in the room. And I think the last few years, if they've taught us anything, is that they were right. You're going to hear over the next couple of days about achievements, about change, about commitment, about passion. And it's not just the Unstereotype Alliance. We applaud and we appreciate any initiatives in this area. But those of us that have been working on the Unstereotype Alliance have the privilege of looking back with enormous pride on what's been achieved and enormous excitement over these next two days about what we can still achieve ahead of us. When we look around, we see now more than 230, almost 240 members around the world, 12 national chapters and counting, reflecting the belief that actually this matters so much that we should take it to the country level, the specificities of each nation and what the challenges are there that we can tackle uh, as a community. More than a trillion dollars of advertising spent per year. Think of the power of that to change minds, to influence what people believe. So for those who've been along for this ride since the beginning, this is an enormous source of pride. And for those who've joined us more recently, we very much welcome you on board. For those who haven't yet, the door is very much open. So this is our first time meeting in person um, in this very special place. We're very excited as UN Women. I think it's probably fair to say this is genuinely actually quite, a, quite an emotional and moving moment if you, if you believe in the power of this, this coalition, this partnership. Um, but we're also determined, together with our, our vice chairs, um, that we take the fullest advantage of this very, very precious time together. I think if there's anything that the last couple of years have taught us, it's how precious it is for us to be able to sit together and plan and develop and drive collective action uh, as we're going to do here. So this theme of raising the bar for positive social change is a very serious one. We mean it. Uh, and we see it as that KPI, the performance indicator for this meeting. Have we raised the bar or not when we leave here? And I think in you and women, we very much want us to make sure that we do and hold ourselves to account for that. We realize that we are meeting at a very tough time for this, this industry, as many others. But tough times are sometimes the best times uh, for reflection and positive change. So let's embrace that. You're going to hear a lot of very inspiring speakers, a lot of amazing topics uh, for this open plenary session, including Unstereotype Alliance members and distinguished guests. I hope tonight you'll go to the reception, see an incredible uh, exhibit, which I think speaks uh, the thousand words uh, that a picture can about what we all care about. 
You're going to be guided through these conversations by the incomparable and truly wonderful Jess, who you've met already, uh, a founding ally of the Unstereotype Alliance, as well as Sarah, who, who, who Jess introduced, who has, I think we can all agree, been the extraordinary beating heart uh, of our alliance uh, and has all of our uh, deep appreciation along with her team. This is going to be an incredible summit. Uh, thank you, all of you, for the time and the energy you're going to put into it. You are the reason why this is going to be an incredible summit, and I look forward to seeing you all and working with you over these next two days uh, and beyond. Let me then pass my genuine pleasure to pass to Anita, Anita Bhatia, our Assistant Secretary General for the United Nations, Deputy Executive Director for UN Coordination, Partnerships, Resources, and Sustainability at UN Women, who's going to give us the opening address. But thank you all. Great to see you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone to the United Nations. Welcome to ECOSOC. My name is Anita Bhatia. I am, as Dan said, the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women and the ASG of the UN, and I'm standing in for our Executive Director, Dr. Seema Sami Bahus, who is the chair of the Unstereotype Alliance, and is really sorry she couldn't be with you here in person because she is at COP27 and just flying back today. She sends her apologies, but I think she will meet some of you tomorrow, and I know she's really looking forward to it. I want to say a very, very warm welcome to all of you, especially to our deputy co-chairs. It is great to see you, Aline, Heidi, and Dale, in person after all these years. I cannot but agree with you, Dan, that the moment has come when we can actually meet together in person, and there is a special quality to being able to meet in person, to connect, to make that human connection, and to be energized together. So all of you global members of the Unstereotype Alliance, national chapter members from across 12 chapters, members of the diplomatic corps here in New York, media, the general public, gender advocates, friends of UN women, the Unstereotype Alliance, and everybody present who is watching us because this is being live streamed. Everybody who's watching us from across the world, welcome. Look, I want to just share a few thoughts with you on the state of gender equality today. I just came back from COP27, uh, and you know, there were a lot of discussions at COP27 about the amount of money that the world needs to put towards solving for climate change. And as my reflection was, there's a huge amount of discussion about the quantity of funding, but not so much about the quality of the funding and how that funding has got to have a gender lens. And of course, that's our job as UN Women to make sure that in these important global fora, we are bringing over and over again the issues of gender inequality so that public policy makers and the world do not forget about the state of the world of gender equality today. So I want to share some facts with you that are from UN Women's latest gender snapshot report. This is something we put out every year. And it's basically a picture of where is the world on gender equality. So this report, which I encourage you all to look at, which is called Progress, the Progress Report, shows three things that are really disturbing. First, it says that if we really want to achieve gender equality, it is going to take not 50 years, not 100 years, not 200 years, but 286 years. So almost three centuries for us to eliminate all discriminatory norms and all laws that stand in the way of gender equality. The second factoid from this report, which is startling, is that it is going to take 140 years before we are able to achieve gender parity in most uh, fields. So, you know, there are lots of other estimates out there from the World Economic Forum, from the Gender Equality Index, but I think uh, we can all agree that 100, 300 years or 140 years is simply not good enough. 
And the third thing that this report shows is that although we talk a lot about progress in women's leadership, representation, when you really look around the world and you see what's actually happened and how many women are there in decision-making roles, you realize that uh, actually it's not that uncommon to see panels as I did over and over again at COP27 that are only men that are only men. So this idea that there has been a real shift in leadership for women is actually not true. Because when you look at how many cabinets in the world are gender equal, it's only 14. At the General Assembly earlier this year, UN Women launched something called the, you know, the global uh, network of women leaders. So we invited heads of state and heads of government who are women to launch this network. There are 193 member states of the UN. Guess how many of them have women leaders? Anyone want to warrant a guess? Anybody? Thank you, 27. So uh, we have 27 leaders in the world who are women. So we are a long way, in other words, from achieving gender equality. And this is why the work that you do in the Unstereotype Alliance to change mindsets, to change norms, is so fundamentally important. And I have nothing but congratulations for you, because when I look at exactly as Dan described, how, when UN Women convened 24 like-minded members six years ago, and when I look at where we are today, the only thing I can say is bravo. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I think the work that you have done and the work that you are doing on a daily basis through this wide cross-section of the global advertising industry, working as a collective to change stereotypes, to change mindsets, is so fundamentally important. Because in the end, you can change laws, you can change uh, quota systems, you can change a lot of things, but to get rid of unconscious bias and to get rid of mindsets that still think about girls, women, and gender in certain ways is a much tougher job. And that's the very tough job that each of you is engaged in day in and day out. So for this, our deepest thanks. Our deepest thanks because it is only when the advertising and marketing industry change of stereotypes, are we really going to be able to see real change? So I want to share with you something that really shocked us. I think it was, maybe Dan, Sarah will remind me when it ex exactly this happened, but I think it was about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, maybe somebody in the team remembers Aldiana, Sarah, Dan, one of you might remember. We saw this advertisement it came to our attention. It was an advertisement for a burger company. It was a burger company in a European country. And this burger company showed a man ordering a burger. It was a comic strip. And the comic strip showed this man asking his partner, perhaps his wife, for a burger. And the next piece in the comic strip showed the woman giving him a burger. It wasn't the burger he wanted. So the next bit of the comic strip showed him hitting her. And I remember looking at this and saying, how is this ad possible in this day and age? How is this ad possible in this country? And so of course, we had to contact not just the firm, that was behind the burger, but the advertising company that had actually drawn this comic for them and had not had the foresight to think about why it wasn't okay to publish this ad. And that was a real aha moment for many of us because it made us realize that this issue of perpetuating stereotypes is taking place on a daily basis everywhere in the world, even in some of the most advanced economies in the world.
So this battle, because it is a battle that we are fighting to change mindsets, is something that is more urgent than ever before. UN Women measures progress in gender equality by looking at what has changed since the Beijing Declaration 26 years ago. And, you know, we can feel happy about a lot of things that have changed for the better for women. Educational rates are up. Maternal mortality is on the decline. There are more women in parliament. There are more women in leadership positions. But the other thing that has changed in the last few years, there are two things that I want to really flag to you. One is the geopolitical environment and the rise in many countries of illiberal democracy and strongman authoritarian regimes who feel that it is essential to suppress women's rights. How many of us ever thought that we would live through seeing what is happening in Afghanistan with women today, where Taliban is determined to erase women from public life? When we look at what is happening to women in Iran, when we look at what is happening to women in Ukraine, we have to say, in many ways, and when we look at the battle for sexual and reproductive rights that is raging in many parts of the world, we have to say that actually, for many women, the world is a much worse off place today than it was 20 years ago. And we are having to relitigate battles that we thought we had already won. In many, many things, we are running to stay in place. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the state of gender equality in the world today. So that is why I am so thrilled that we have the collective brain power of the people in this room to work on these really difficult, knotty, complex issues of changing stereotypes, changing mindsets. The fact that the Unstereotype Alliance has grown 18-fold to the current 237 members, including 12 national chapters on five continents, gives me great hope. Because if we have grown that much, we can grow even more. So this is why the title of today, this summit, Raising the Bar, is so important. I really want you to take into account the facts that I have shared with you so that together we can have a collective ambition about raising the bar. Because if we do not raise the bar, we will be fighting these battles, not just in my daughter's lifetime, not just in my granddaughter's lifetime, but in my great-granddaughter's lifetime. And frankly, people, that is too long a time for us to be battling something that we should be able to take for granted in 2022. Gender equality is something we should not be fighting for in this day and age. I keep saying when I see legislation, when I see people's attitudes, this is 2022, it's not 1822. But the fact is that in many, many aspects of gender equality, it feels as we have regressed, not a decade, but actually centuries. And that is an absolutely unacceptable state of affairs for anybody who wants to make the planet a better place. We are facing today the poly crisis of conflict, climate change, and the result of COVID-19. If things were bad three years ago, they have just gotten a lot worse. And so I don't want to leave you with a sense that everything is hopeless because in fact, it is things like this, this Global Member Summit that really gives us hope because when you have, as Dan said, a trillion dollars of advertising going towards uh, changing mindsets and norms, then we know that the world has the people, the energy, and the passion to make the world a better place. That's what we are all here for together. I thank you for your commitment. I thank you for your dedication. And I really want to wish you an absolutely fantastic summit for the next two days. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anita. I know we're all sort of deep breathing and absorbing. 
what you just shared. And certainly running to stay in place is a phrase and an image I'm gonna keep in my mind. Um, I think one of the things that, for those that are new to, uh, to our summit experience, um, I think one of the ways perhaps to kind of integrate the conversations today is to think about our personal accountability and responsibility on this. I think sometimes when we think so broadly, that can feel so overwhelming of how do we individually make change, right? How could I possibly make a difference? And I think you're gonna hear and see in this room today uh, specific ways to create impact and to create change so that we can take the incredibly sobering and yet motivating words from Anita and pull them into action today. With that, I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, as you know, and you've heard now, our key objective here with the Unstereotype Alliance is to create that positive social change and to use advertising and media as a force for good. But as we consider where we are in some social regression and we find ourselves asking, what is the role of brands and creatives in this space? So again, back to the personal accountability and reflection. And more so, how do we actually measure impact? How do we measure this social impact? How do we know if what we're doing is actually driving positive change towards the sustainable development goals? To explain this and to delve into this deeper, I'm delighted to invite to the stage Jaime Garcia, who is the Senior Global Advisor uh, for the Social Progress Imperative. Please welcome Jaime. Thank you. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm coming from Costa Rica, so I have to start this saying pura vida, pure life because that's very powerful. It, but it's not only about life, it's about good life. And it's, it is what we are going to talk today. I measure social progress, I measure welding, I measure quality of life, I measure the social progress index. Now, I have done this around the world, and I can tell you, this is not the world. But sometimes, we think that this is the world. We move, we decide, we develop strategies thinking that this is the world. Simple, flat, plain. But let me tell you something. The world is complicated. The world is difficult. We already know that there are multiple crises around the world at the same time. Humanitarian crisis, political crisis, ecological crisis, technological crisis, full of crises since the last decades. And suddenly, we have also these black swans, and they change everything. And they create these recessions and regressions. And of course, it's a virus, it's a pandemic, but it's not about health, it's about systems. We need to start thinking about systems. Yes, it was a health crisis, but also an educative crisis. It was an economic crisis. It was a digital strategy that we need to do it was a force that increased the poverty around the world, stopped sectors like tourism, and also put pressure on governments. We need to start thinking that we are connected. Forget about this planet. Forget about this icon. But sometimes, as I told you, we only focus on this Earth. It's like the same, just to see economic indicators. Isolated from this more complicated planet, Isolated from the environment, from the society, from the people. And it's not only about recognize that the world is complicated. It's also about recognize that we are connected. All the countries, but also the environment, the society, and the people. And we need to put that into our strategies, into our measurements, into our actions. But, you know, sometimes we are just seeing this as isolated. And if we do that, then we are not seeing the complexities and the challenges of our reality. We are just seeing pieces of the world, pieces of the crisis. We are just generating pieces of the solutions. And we are not moving forward. We can't raise the bar if we are not seeing the world as complicated as it is. That's why we thinking about beyond GDP thinking about the SDGs, we developed the Social Progress Index. It's a tool that you can use for inspiration to measure your impact. It's a tool that is based uh, on the shoulder of giants, Amartya Sen, Stieglitz, Jean-Paul Fitoussi. And for me, it's like, you know, 
the phrase that I have here always in my mind, if we have the wrong metrics, we will strip for the wrong things. What are we measuring? How are we evaluating our impact? And this is really important, and it's not only about businesses, about society, it's also about governments, but also people. And it's not only about data, it's also about the right data. These are the principal designs of the Social Progress Index. Yes, we measure social and environmental indicators, but check the second one, outcomes, not inputs. Sometimes businesses, governments, they just report inputs, the efforts, the funding, the number of participants, the number of events, the number of likes, the number of shares. But what about report, actually? What is happening with, that, with those efforts in terms of moving the needle? We need, when measuring our impact, take that into account, check the outcomes. We are also, because we are all connected, presenting an index that is relevant for all countries. I have measured this in the Amazonia, in Brazil, but also in Iceland, in Finland, around the world, and the idea is to put data into action. This is not academic, even though I work also in, in, a, in a business school in Costa Rica. This is, is for businesses, this is for governments, this is for NGOs, and this is for all. This is the framework of the Social Progress Index. Three dimensions, 12 components. The first dimension, nutrition and basic medical care, water and sanitation, shelter, personal safety. The basic stuff that we need to have in a community, in a society. The second one, foundations of welding, is about those structures that we have that allows to have good lives and long lives. Education, access to information and communication. I have been in the middle of the Amazonia, in, in, in the middle of the jungle, with people working in rural environments that they are connected and they are asking for connection. They don't have water, they don't have electricity, but they are asking for connection. Health and wellness, well, we just passed this pandemic, or we are trying to do it. We know now the importance of health and wellness. Environmental quality, we're in the middle of this crisis. And the third dimension is opportunity. In this dimension, we are measuring the social structures, the institutional arrangements that allow that each individual reach their full potential. It's a Marcia Sen thinking here. And we are measuring personal rights, personal freedom and choice, inclusiveness, and access to advanced education. And after seeing this, if you are thinking in this, yes, we are in the same page. We are talking the SDG language. We are aligned with that. Now, the index is not only to measure how well we are doing it in terms of SDGs. It's also to show that we are connected. Again, if inclusion fails, if equality fails, if political rights fails, everything fails. Even economic growth fails. We have examples in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, around the world. When something fails, everything stops. This is a system. Every year since 2013, uh, with the development of the first index with Professor Michael Porter, Scott Stern, and Roberto Artavia, we have measured this for countries. Now, we measure it for 169 countries using six indicators. Some of those indicators are very straightforward and traditional maternal mortality rate, homicide rates, but also we measure inclusiveness, freedoms, some stuff that people is not used to visualize or to measure or to communicate, but they are really important. And I will show you what happened with these indicators in the world. We are putting a score to the countries. Zero is the worst country in all those indicators. No one has zero. 100, the best country in all those indicators. No one has 100, but this is the world. Well, this is a map of the world. And if you think about those indicators, and if you see this map without colors, it's, it's because if I told you that the best countries are the Scandinavian, it's not a surprise. If I told you that Canada, that Western Europe is doing it good, it's not a surprise. If I told you that Africa is lagging behind, it's not a surprise. We have seen it with the Human Development Index. We have seen it with other indices. But if I put the people in this map, I will show you this. I will show you that 83% of the population is living in countries lagging behind in social progress. Generating social progress is complicated, is scarce, is difficult. That's why we need to put the people into the statistics, just to understand that, yes, 
geography matters. But when talking about society, we need to focus on the people. Now, the challenge is huge. And it's not because this 83% that we need to improve. It's because generating social progress goes beyond GDP, go beyond just putting more money on this. And this is the chart that is showing how the income has diminishing returns. Sorry, I'm an economist, so that, that's why I'm using that. But in other words, the more income you have, if you are a poor country, then you increase very quick your social progress because your needs are basic. But when you increase your income, it's more complicated for you to translate that income into social progress. You need something else. You need better institutions. You need better social arrangements. Think about, for example, inclusiveness. I can't go to Amazon and buy pills for inclusion. That doesn't exist. But I can go and buy infrastructure for water, infrastructure for electricity. That I can do. But once that we solve that, what do we need? And it's not only about more income. It's not only about the short term. It's also about the middle term and long term. Social progress is dynamic. We have measured this since 2011, now with, with data in, 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 in time. And we have seen that the world has improved. That, that's a fact. On average, we have improved. Now, the problem here is that since 2017, we are seeing a decrease in the speed of growing social progress. If we keep these trends, we're going to have a social progress recession in 2023. And I put this question. We know how to deal with economic crisis. We know we have lived with economic crisis since the last 30 years. But with social progress crisis around the world, I don't know if we have the answers. Of course, first we need to see what is happening in terms of social progress. Well, as I told you, we are very good with the low-hanging fruits. We can buy water, we can buy shelter, we can buy technology. Those are the components that increased the most since 2011. The easy ones. But personal rights has declined. And is the reason of the social progress recession that we are seeing. And also, a stagnation on inclusiveness around the world. So the data is telling us where we are failing. Now, maybe you are going to say, well, yes, we can increase the income, increase the funding, uh, do more events. Well, no, it's not that easy. Maybe that can work for shelter, for access to information and communication. Put Wi-Fi in the Amazonia is relatively easy. But stop the problems of migration from rural to, to urban cities is complicated. Personal rights is not as easy to solve as the other challenges. And the problem is that we are seeing 112 countries around the world that are decreasing in personal rights. The, the bigger declines are in Africa and Latin America, but check the G7 countries, Canada, United Kingdom, France, and the United States. This is happening practically around the world. And you are going to say, this is problem of the governments. This is problems of politicians. Why do I care? Well, remember. Personal rights, inclusiveness, opportunities are not only about democracy or governments, are expressions of our social values and beliefs. Our social arrangements are parts of the norms that we have as a society, and we are connected. We know also that if we want to change these harmful stereotypes, we need to take into account the context in the families, in the households but also the context in the economic activities and the context in the cities and in the countries. And what we are seeing is that the context is not, is not helping us to finish with these harmful stereotypes. And we have the data to show you. We cross the opportunities score that we calculated with the outputs of this global survey uh, about gender equality that Meta or Facebook did a couple of years ago, and we found that in countries with low score in the opportunity dimension, with lowest levels of freedom, of rights, of inclusiveness, we have more than 50% of the population that agree that the most important role of women is just to take care of her home and children. The national context, the institutions are showing me that 
are key to change that kind of stereotypes. Now, I'm worried because we can buy personal rights. We have seen that we can buy inclusiveness. We can buy opportunities. We are seeing that the trends are declining around the world. It doesn't matter if you are in Europe, in Latin America, or in Africa. It doesn't matter if you are a rich country or not. We are into a personal rights recession, a social progress recession. How are we going to solve it? Not like this. I love the coffee, and I think that with coffee you can do a lot of stuff, but not just wait to see everything burn. We need to move. Now, we know that we need other approaches, and I think that we know, and that's why we are all here today, that with partnerships we can do something else beyond just put efforts, try to move the needle, raise the bar. And businesses, I can tell you, generate social progress. How? Well, a business with a strategy with purpose, present and active in the society, with a culture of high performance, with leadership, and taking care of what? The value chain, the people, their people, the clients, and the community. If we start working in our businesses aligned with this, we can change the norms, the values, the beliefs, one by one. But of course, this is not philanthropy. I'm not selling you another effort that is not rigorous, as for example, finances or accountability. We are talking about using data, a data-driven strategy. How? Well, yes, let's measure. But after the measurement, we need a strategy. We need collaboration and we need communication. Communication helps us to translate the technical stuff into the practical stuff, and we need to do it. And you are the experts in that, because you, all of you are experts in how to communicate, how to change the norms and the beliefs. Now, of course, I'm asking you to measure something complicated. Environment, society, outcomes, maybe that's scary. And it's scary because it's not business as usual. But as a data expert, I can tell you that measurement, well, measurement is the easy part. We have measured in the tourist sector in Costa Rica. We have measured in districts in India. We have measured inclusiveness in Europe. We have measured inclusiveness in the value chain of cocoa and coffee in Latin America and Africa. We have measured at census tract level for 500 cities in the United States, and of course in the Amazonia. I have been here, I have been there, and, and, and it's complicated, but we need to, to do that even in the middle of the, of the jungle. Now, this is not about the statistics, this is not about metrics, this is not about academia, this is about action. This is about how to take the data, how to develop the strategy, and generate this collaboration to align messages, coordinate interventions, and optimize resources. We have a lot of funding, but we need to be more efficient. How can we do it in a world with an economic crisis, but also in a world that is going backwards in personal rights, in institutions, in inclusiveness? This is the challenge that I'm presenting to you today. Put the people in your statistics, in your strategy, in your communication. Talk to private firms, civil society, academia, government, but also understand that we are not isolated. Remember, we are connected, and this is about systems. Because if we want to end these harmful stereotypes, we need to remember that it's about society, it's about social progress. It's not only about change the way I'm selling something. It's about understanding that the way I'm communicating something is the way that we are going to change the values, the norms, the institutions. Now, the risk is huge. Generating a good community, a sustainable city, a free country, a world with high social progress, decreasing the stereotypes is the challenge of our generation. Along with the other crises that we have, that's a huge challenge. We haven't done it before. That's why we are here today. But at the same time, we have never been connected as we have before. We have people from Africa, from Asia, uh, from Latin America. We are all connected by YouTube and the digital world. We have never been in this way connected. That is very powerful. We have never had also 
a society that measures everything. We can measure everything. We measure feelings, we measure steps, we measure likes, we measure everything. Now, how can we connect the connectivity with the measurement to generate something that matters? To raise the bar and focus on the SDGs. The challenge is huge, is huge but I think that we have the tools to succeed. Now, the thing is, not work on silos, collaborate, use data to generate your strategies, communicate, and try to think in the SDGs as this system that we need to use to change these harmful stereotypes. Thank you, and pura vida. Thank you, Jaime. What incredible food for thought, especially as we venture and set the scene for the next two days of our discussion where we're going to be talking very explicitly about impact and measurement. Um, throughout the morning and over the next two days, we're going to be watching highlights from around the world, testimonials and achievements from the Unstereotype Alliance's 12 national chapters. And of course, we're going to see some great unstereotyped ads. And first up, a way to set the scene and explain even further what the Alliance works to achieve and why. We're proud to present Conversations for Change, a powerful piece produced this year by our UK national chapter and now being emulated across the Alliance. Let's take a look. Advertising has a role in impacting cultural change and advertising is very much a microcosm of the stories out there in the real world. And so having inclusion and representation at the heart of that is important in how we see those stories and how we tell those stories. When I talk about what it's like to be from a minority group in terms of lived experiences, I think it's just that feeling that you don't fit in. Even if we just look at the media, 59% um, of articles that are about Muslims are negative. Over a third misrepresent or are stereotyped. And I think that constant messaging slowly can almost make you feel like the parts of you that make you you are things that you should be hide. I went and got my hair cut, number one all the way around, so I shaved my head. When they thought that I was a boy, nobody said that I couldn't play football. Nobody questioned how good I was. I was pretending to be something I wasn't, but I felt much more at home. I felt part of the team. I first remember sort of experiencing racism when I was about five or six, and my family moved to a new area, um, and bricks were thrown through our window because people didn't like the fact that we were a black family moving into a white area. My best friend, she was buying makeup, and I inquired what choice is there for me, and the shop assistant said that, I'm sorry, uh, madam, we only stock normal colours. The first time that I became really aware of that we needed better representation in advertising was working as a, a junior creative on a social campaign. And I put forward a, an LGBT couple to two females to be part of this campaign. The next morning, we I came into a, a meeting with my MD and CEO and they said that the client was really angry. They hadn't realized we'd put an LGBT couple forward. It really hit me straight in their heart. I can't believe that they'll allow me to create all their work, but to be part of their work or be in front of that work. Um, they just didn't want it there. I would be left off pitch teams, even if I'd worked on the pitch behind the scenes, I would be left off pitch teams because um, the agencies I worked for at the time didn't want to give the client the wrong impression, whatever that looked like. I just knew that at times I had a bit of a, a, bit of a block towards me. Something needs to change, representation needs to be out there, and it needs to be a positive thing for brands. I think for me, I was always conscious of the need for better representation in advertising because I never saw myself on screen. And for that reason, I, I felt like I could never also be that woman that would be on the front of a beauty campaign. I never felt like I could be on the front of like Vogue because I never saw that. And I think that definitely impacted how I felt about myself. That's the definition of beauty that you grow up with. And if you can't you know, if that doesn't reflect you, then what that says to you is, is that you're not beautiful. You need to see yourself in the advert you're consuming. If you can't see it, you can't be it. There is a lot of lazy, unfounded, untruths and stereotypes 
and associations that are um, accredited to uh, minority groups. Like overly camp representations of gay men, like we saw James Corden doing prom, or um, there were some other ads that have been over time where the camp person is the annoying one or the irritating one. Being perverted, sexually irresponsible, like there's a real kind of sexual stigma that exists around uh, LGBTQ plus people. You think of Islam, and a lot of the things that you think about, thanks to media, is it's a bomber. People like me and groups like me, we're treated as imposters um, within structures, within systems. And so that has a knock-on effect to then how you see yourself and also how other groups see you. Black females are aggressive. That's a very, very lazy trope um, and very, very harmful. And what it discounts is adversity, the power of adversity, the fact that black women have actually had a lot on their shoulders for a very long time and had to still keep it going. And that power of adversity is something that women, black women, can tap into and create into something remarkable. But because of the stereotypes, it dismisses all of that, and that means innovation is lost. People withdraw because they feel exhausted of having to fight those stereotypes again and again and again. It's like um, tiny little paper cuts over and over and over again on your, on your identity. And I think that constant messaging to a person, regardless of how confident they are in their identity, slowly can chip away. It's almost like waves chipping at a shoreline. When did I feel truly represented what in advertising? No, I don't think I've ever have, actually. I think every now and again you see glimpses. And you see glimpses of um, the kind of sense of human kind of personalities that I know is out there. I do see now a lot more people of colour um, on the telly now and within ads. Um, I get the feeling now it's been, you know, let's get more of them on the screen. The danger is that as, ad as advertisers, we actually start following trends and doing like mm -hmm. trendy, picking trendy communities. I think the LGBT community was certainly a trendy one. And now we're seeing people picking up um, the black community, which is great and essential, but we also need to think why and how. It would always be a South Asian woman who's either been forced into marriage or who's desperate to get married or comes from a family which um, the only thing that they can see for that woman is marriage and having a family. And my family didn't necessarily push that onto me. Um, they always encouraged me to go out and be independent and make a career for myself. And I never saw that on TV. Disabled people when we don't see ourselves represented in a positive light, when we only see us as victims or being portrayed as people who are suffering or don't want to live a joyous life, we internalise that and then we start to believe that as well. Are we just sowing one type of person within those communities? Drag, although a really great and celebratory part of our communities, become a trend. We've seen it in bank ads, we've seen it in car ads, we've seen it in every type of ad, but we haven't seen anything else. We want to portray South Asian women as being independent. We want to celebrate them as whole individuals, as kind of multi-dimensional individuals. And I think that's often missing from campaigns. We need to show that breadth. And actually, LGBT people from all, all communities do everything that we that anyone else does, but we don't show that. So I think that's what we need to start doing to sort of making more progressive and representation. I felt truly represented when I saw m my family looking back at me. I think having a six-year-old, being a gay man, you don't often see that reflected back. I think we've started to see little bits of representation out there, more so for actually gay parents, gay male parents, than any other part of the community. Um, but I remember seeing an ad, I think it was in McCain's, where two guys were opening the, the, the oven and there was a baby there. And I was like, oh my God, that's my family. Um, and more so that my child's there and she can see her family as well. Childlines Understand Me campaign, which we got involved in as well uh, back in 2018, was about tackling uh, discrimination and hate crimes towards children from different ethnic minority backgrounds. I guess the, the reason I really liked about it was I saw myself in it, in the sense of a Muslim boy with a traditional attire, with a backpack, being treated as a sort of terrorist with a bomb. And I've been in that situation. Uh, and I love the fact that a brand tackled that, and they tackled it in a way that they believed in us in what we do versus uh, 
challenging what we were trying to do. Something that had a really big impact on me was seeing how the children reacted to the, the FIFA game. Once the women were in the, that FIFA game, then all the children were talking about it. FIFA had given them that platform and that they deserved a place uh, to be looked at in the same light as, as the male players. So once you create a game like that to children, it kind of normalises football is a game for everybody. It doesn't matter what gender you are. Representation means seeing myself celebrated even just for a moment on screen. Uh, so to see the work that we were able to create with the Amazon ad, an intergenerational conversation between two black women through the lens of kindness to this day is really powerful, still makes me cry. Something I can proudly tell my family that I was a part of, but I know for other black women who look like me, it was a moment we'll never forget. I think the best way to avoid stereotypes um, around representation is tell authentic stories. Make sure you're doing your research. Uh, make sure the people doing the research um, are from the background you're trying to target. Listen to people from minoritized communities move beyond intention and really think about impact. Um, and I would say often we use this phrase, people like to consult, or oh, we consulted with this organization, that organization, we consulted with this community. It needs to go beyond consultation and, and involve and embed those communities in your decision making at every level. And my final bit of advice would be to challenge your agencies on this stuff and don't give up. Don't accept, oh, we only ever work with these partners or we don't have the budget or our budget needs to go here. Um, I feel strongly that it's brands that need to lead the charge and that means holding your agencies to accountable because I, I genuinely believe that, you know, the industry is, is sort of ready and needs to do this. They're just looking for brands to lead and brands need to lead in this space. I think it's so important, you know, inside of our own organisations that we do lots in order to make people, or our colleagues, feel like they can be them but also that we use the power of our craft to make people outside of our organisations, society, feel like they can be them as well. Good morning. My name is Sarah Denby. I'm head of the Unstereotype Alliance Secretariat at UN Women. And it is such a pleasure to see all of you here today. This summit has been a long time coming. Um, I joined and took this role seven weeks before we were due to have a great summit in 2020. And then the plug got pulled four days before. Um, people were literally on their way to New York. And um, of course, we, we were then home and living a very different life um, for, for at least the next year. So. We made it, we're back here, um, and it's so great to have you all with us. Um, I spent 18 years working in advertising agencies around the world. Uh, and then I started postgrad study in human rights, and seven years ago I chose to leave Adland and work in gender equality in Cambodia and Australia and now here. But when I took this role, people asked me, well, how do you feel about effectively going back to working with the ad industry? Really, I could just show them that film in response. It speaks to everything that bothered me. It speaks to everything that I observed and saw in the many different agencies and the several different countries that I worked in. But it's also what I observed as a consumer on screen. Um, and it certainly didn't represent the wonderfully complex, culturally diverse communities that I grew up in in New Zealand. It didn't reflect any of the communities I lived in in five other countries around the world. And if it bothered me, I could only imagine how it felt to those who saw themselves invisible on screen. For simply too long, the industry has not been diverse or inclusive. And who makes the work is who shows up in the work, right? We know that. The Unstereotype Alliance and UN Women produces the Gender Equality Attitude Study. It's a biennial study and it's now across 20 countries in the world. And this year showed that 72% of people believe that media still portrays men in traditional roles. So head of the family, professional, 
um, provider, hot guy in a fast car with a nice watch, you know the type. I don't, sadly, but... And 68% and believe that women are still portrayed in traditional roles, so mother, caregiver, supporter. They believe it because they see it. Our 2021 unstereotype metric data revealed that just 2% of ads in the last year featured a person with a disability. Research from the Gina Davis Institute for Gender and Media showed in 2021 LGBTIQ plus characters featured in creative work at a dismal 2%. So how is this really impacting us? Well, we see it alarmingly in attitudes across the world. Across 20 countries in our study, gender equality is still viewed as more important by women, but we are seeing more regressive attitudes in younger men. And shockingly, there's been an increase in respondents who agree that there are acceptable reasons to hit your partner or spouse. Running to stay where we are doesn't begin to describe. The power of advertising is that it has always been about behavior change. That's the art and the science of it, right? So changing your behavior, whether it's the dishwashing liquid you buy or the car you drive, the credit card you use or who you vote for. And with that brings enormous potential to shift people's attitudes, to shape the way we see ourselves and each other, to be reminded that difference is nothing to be afraid of. And one of the most captivating voices that I've heard speak on this subject is our next keynote speaker. Monroe Bergdorf is an internationally renowned activist, model, writer, and broadcaster, and a proud ambassador for gender variant and transgender people. Appointed as British Vogue contributing editor this year, in February next year, she will become a published author. To us, she is nothing short of an icon. Monroe uses her platform and profile to amplify marginalized voices, offering insight on trans and LGBTIQ plus topics interlocked with feminism and diversity. She's been named among 100 Great Black Britons, sits on L'Oreal UK's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Board. She's a UN Women UK change maker, and just this month at Glamour, Glamour's Women of the Year Awards was named Beauty Change Maker for consistently championing diversity in the beauty industry. So many accolades, I actually have to follow my notes for this, and, and I'm scratching the surface, believe me. Monroe's been invited to speak around the world, and in June, she appeared for the Unstereotype Alliance on the main stage at the Cannes Lions Festival of Creativity. And today, we are so proud to welcome her to the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, in conversation with our friend Jess Wiener, please welcome Ms. Monroe Bergdorf. Hello. Hello. We've only Zoomed and phoned, so happy to see you in person and happy to have you here. And to dig in uh, and build on this conversation uh, this morning, um, Monroe, I want to talk about the relationship that you have with brands. You know, as a brand consultant myself, it is nuanced, it is yes. complex, it is rooted in the relationships yeah. um, that we create. Will you talk a little bit about your journey mm -hmm. to and how you work with brands and that relationship? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, so I started actually in fashion PR. So that's where I got my understanding originally for how brands can push new messages. Mm -hmm. And the thing with, um, you know, working in fashion is that the messages are ever moving. The bar is ever being raised, hopefully. Um, so I got into the industry really PRing other people's mm -hmm. products. And then I went into the more creative side with modeling. Um, and then I started to realize how limited the industry was in terms of who got the opportunities, who was in front of the camera, who was behind the camera as well. And um, I just 
felt like I wanted to be the change that I wasn't seeing. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know why trans people weren't being represented within the industry. And then I started working more with um, designers and photographers. Um, I did a campaign with a Lebanese couture designer, Ziad Ghanem, who gave me my first big break. Mm -hmm. And that led to working with Uniqlo, which led to um, shooting with David Bailey and um, other well-renowned photographers. Um, and then I started talking about my experiences, which mm. was something that wasn't really seen at that time. Mm. We weren't having the conversations around sexuality, around gender or identity even. Right. And race was definitely a no-go area. You didn't talk about racism. And I was just really keen to change that. Mm -hmm. I knew that fashion was for everybody. And it didn't make sense to me why so much of the industry was cutting out people that they really should want to buy their brands. Mm -hmm. We should make sure that the industry reflects everybody and that there's opportunities behind the camera that are for everybody. And that's when you get your most effective product is when it's being built by a team that reflects everyone. When you are, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the power dynamic mm -hmm. in this journey for you. And when you move from PRing somebody else's message yeah. to now becoming a face, body, a voice, you know, and you're noticing the disparity systemically on those sets. What, can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to find that voice to speak out about that? Because oftentimes I hear a lot of models as an example say they're on a set, somebody doesn't know how to do their hair. Somebody doesn't know how to do their makeup, but they don't want to speak up about that because yeah. they're afraid of that power imbalance and quite frankly, of losing that job. And I'm curious for you, because I know you're an activist at heart, but I'm curious for you, if you go back to that moment in time, mm. was it difficult for you to find that voice and how did you start to speak up about what you saw? It was really difficult because there's always a lot of resistance yeah. with any conversation that isn't the general consensus. Um, I mean, we've seen so much change and so much progress when it comes to how we talk about race, especially especially after the George Floyd protests. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen so much change in terms of how gender identity is talked about, especially with so much visibility and representation of trans people within the mainstream media. Um, but it really takes people working together. And I found that when I started talking to other models of marginalized um, experiences, that we could pull together and we could say that this is an isolated opinion, this is an experience that runs throughout the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also about plugging into people that, you know, have higher ranking jobs than you maybe. Um, and um, again, working together, I think activism isn't something that you can do on your own. It's something that you really need to make sure that you are plugged into networks, plugged into societies, plugged into unions, and recognize that it's like a machine. And I can do this, you can do that, let's pull together. So um, once I started speaking to different people um, who were also in the industry and working together, that made it so much easier than getting it across myself. Well, and I, I just, I want to, I commend you on the courage of that because I think at the heart of some of these conversations when folks, you know, have been deeply marginalized mm -hmm. and underrepresented and they get a chance to speak about it, they're often shut down yes. right away. I've definitely had experiences of that. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people will have um, heard about a beauty campaign that I was involved in where um, I spoke about systemic racism and in a, in a way, mm -hmm. in retrospect, was that was in, I was in distress and yeah. I was um, sincerely hurt w witnessing the Charlottesville yeah. riots um, in which a woman was murdered um, by a white supremacist and seeing Nazis march. It just felt like the manifestation of everything that I feared, especially, um, you know, with uh, people coming into politics that really shook people to their core. Um, so... It was, it was really difficult to merge working in fashion and also have an opinion about what was going on in the world that affects me every single day. Um, and I was actually sacked from that campaign for speaking about what um, I believe to be true and what now, after um, 2020 and the George Floyd protests, everybody yeah. is now on the same page with, hopefully. Um, so it's... I think that that situation shows yep. that time does move and we need to move with it. Yes. And also how brands, even if you don't get it right initially, 
I think it's about opening up a discourse um, and holding yourselves accountable, not being afraid of being cancelled. I think it's really about being aware that when you speak about marginalised experiences, there's going to be pushback. Mm -hmm. There's going to be people that have a heavy investment in keeping, the way, keeping yeah. things the way that they are. And actually today, I'm now a consultant for that same brand mm -hmm. that sacked me. <laughs> um, because I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I want, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the fear that brands have of cancel culture in a yes. second, but I'm glad that you shared that, that yeah. ending to the story. It's been a real full it has been a journey. Moment, yeah. Well, and I, I want to go back to that moment because I think so many folks in the room, and we've heard it a little bit echoed in our keynotes mm -hmm. this morning already, which is about a deep investment in the kinds of relationships with partners that we have, not doing it at a yes. surface or tokenized level to say, ah, I've worked with this group, check the box, or I've worked with that yes. group. But as that moment happened, if you can just share from the outside of somebody who was you know, working with a brand mm -hmm. and that moment happened, what does that feel like for you? Where does your mind go in that space? Were you determined to get back up and continue working with brands or did that even for a moment deter you from making some of the systemic change inside the industry? Well, it definitely deterred me because unfortunately this brand is one of the biggest brands in the world. And you know, when one of the biggest brands in the world doesn't want to work with you, it sends a message to everybody below. Um, but I didn't, not want to continue what I got into the industry for. I think it's really important to um, understand why things are happening. Once you understand why, then it doesn't hit the same. Mm -hmm. It makes you more determined to change things. So I think it made me more determined to, again, be the change, keep speaking up, keep speaking about what was actually happening here from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of, um, concern that um, what I was speaking about was too radical and I think that that's where a lot of brands get stuck is that they feel people aren't ready for the change that the message is going to detract from the product yeah. that it's going to be too much too soon um, that the pushback is going to be too much to deal with and um, that often sometimes is the case but we've all seen how advertising and industries um, that are consumerable um, are, you know, can lead the change when governments aren't. Right. And that, I think that that's really where we're at. You know, historically, capitalism has maintained standards when it comes to beauty, when it comes to respectability, when it comes to ideas of family, when it comes to, um, you know, racial um, stereotypes, yeah. essentially. Um, but now, you know, we're seeing governments uphold those same standards. We're seeing governments refuse to offer dignity to their transgender citizens. We're seeing, um, you know, politicians push through racist legislations. So I really feel that capitalism, even though historically it has upheld an exclusionary um, kind of like mission, I think now, they can lead the change. Mm. And, you know, as a f someone in the fashion industry, women and gay men are in decision-making roles at the highest, at the top. Yeah. And what other industry do you see that in? And I think it's really interesting to see how the image of marginalized groups is now being pushed um, in a way where people are questioning their own biases. Mm. We're questioning why haven't we seen different kind of family dynamics up until this point when they've always existed. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that you know fashion and um, advertising can be such mm -hmm. a important catalyst for change. When you were reapproached, I'm curious, and I'm sure the room is curious as well. What does that reapproach three years later look like? So you get sacked. It's public knowledge, yeah. you're speaking out about that, and then a couple of years later, you reconcile with the brand, and well, it was it was five years. Oh, five years, okay, <laughs> five years later. Yeah. And then talk a little bit about, I'm curious how you re-engage that relationship. Like in all yeah. good relationships, did you establish new boundaries that were needed? What was their growth like? Like I'm curious how you come back together, because I think this is also a part of the powerful story of making change within. Yes, well, I think too often we get stuck on cancel culture and get mm -hmm. stuck on, you know, when someone does something that we don't agree with, it's almost like banishing them out of the kingdom. But I think if you can find resolve, if you can find a way to work together, then you should do and recognize that, you know, people don't always act in their, in, you know, people don't always have their finest moments all the time. Yeah. Um, I myself haven't always had my finest moments all the time as well. And I think that you know, if someone comes to me and says, you know, you could have reacted in a different way, 
how about we do this together and hopefully find a way to um, get to where we want in a common goal, I think that that's a far more productive use of our time. So um, I... It was in the midst of the George Floyd um, protests and um, there was a, a viral black square being shared mm -hmm. and um, L'Oreal shared the black square and that triggered me because I felt like we, you know, we, we, did, we couldn't see eye to eye when the same message was being um, shared um, back in the day in 2017. And... Um, I eventually jumped on a call with um, Delphine, who is um, uh, in very, very high up in L'Oreal, and um, it was a long Zoom call. It was about three hours, uh, and um, we really just decided that it was really important that we open up this conversation in a way where there isn't fingers being pointed. It's really about how can we change the company dynamic? How can we change the wider industry as an industry leader? Yep. And um, out of that conversation, they formed a board, mm -hmm. um, which I sit on, um, which talks about how and focuses on how um, the company is changing the culture within, um, you know, within their own company, but also within the industry. Yeah. And like, how can they be a leader of change as one of the biggest um, companies yeah. in the world, so. I, I appreciate you sharing some of those other details um, because I think as we look at this as perfection can become enemy the good. Yes when we look to make social impact like yes. this. And I appreciate the evolution and the revolution of which you've created in your work, right? And the recognition that relationships evolve and change and culture evolves and changes. Yes, it's, it's difficult because when you're talking about systemic oppression, expecting people to talk about it in a very like lucid, yeah. a very you know calm way is, is a big part of the problem as well because yeah. this is something that affects people every single day that gatekeep, gatekeeps people's um, careers, people's lives, and um, it's, it's distressing and it's traumatic. Yeah. And I think it's really important that when we talk about these issues, we're really holding space for people to be emotional, for people to be frank and candid about their experiences, but also to try and find a way to change things yes. rather than just continuing that yes. hurt and that, um, you know, that distance between. Yes. And one of the things that we've, um, you know, we've talked about, and I know a lot of companies that I work with, the, the Achilles heel is the feeling of cancel culture of what's going yes. to happen yes. when social media in particular turns against you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that because I I think you've got a really interesting point of view yes. on cancel culture. So let's let's dive into that a little bit. Does it really exist or how do we think about it? Well, it exists because we talk about it all the time, but I think in terms of how it is framed is often limited when mm -hmm. it's a really nuanced conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we look throughout history, marginalized people are the people that have been canceled consistently when it comes to reporting in the media, when it comes to access to housing, to healthcare, to dignity, just walking down the street, you know, marginalized people are canceled every single day. And I think what we're seeing now is people that have never been held accountable are being held accountable because it's only very recently with social media that marginalized groups and the general public really have had a voice and been able to push back against messages that are exclusionary or um, harmful. Um, so I think really when you get to that point of being held accountable in a way that you've never been held accountable before, you've got an opportunity to either push back and double down mm -hmm. or you can listen. And I think that there's so much power in listening, holding your hands up and saying, well, okay, yep. we didn't get that right, but there's a way to work through that. And that's when you bring consultants in in a sustainable continuous way right. I think working as a continuum is the most important thing rather than you know just working in crisis mode right. and then scrambling to which like is often kind of, how we think yeah. about doing that we reach out when yeah. it hasn't gone the way we wanted it to go and this is why it's so important that the infrastructure is there as a continuum yes. that you've got 
in, that you invest in diversity, equity, and inclusion boards, that you have people that are there to hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. I'm um, part of this board to hold people accountable, to give my honest opinion, not to just reinforce and you know make people feel good about what they're doing. I think it's really important to um, identify the pitfalls and the holes um, mm -hmm. in um, the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, I do think that cancel culture exists, but I think the way that we talk about it is often short-sighted because we aren't often looking at it from the perspective of marginalized people. We're looking yeah. at it in terms of people that have platforms right. that are holding on to them even when they are behaving in ways that aren't progressive. Right. So for instance, um, there's a well-known author who um, continuously posts anti-trans rhetoric, but posts anti-trans rhetoric on some of the biggest platforms in the world and then complains that she's being um, cancelled, but she still continues to have opportunity after opportunity, whilst marginalised people and trans people are still not getting access to healthcare, access to mental health services, mm -hmm. um, are navigating, escalating hate crimes in yes. the UK. So it's extremely frustrating to see such privileged people complain about being cancelled, but still, you know, be selling millions of books, to be, still be um, offered... Um, think pieces in right. the biggest um, publications. It's, it's extremely frustrating. So let's flip it um, right. and try to look at it as accountability rather than cancellation. That's what I was going to say. I think the language shift involved in cancel culture is actually a call to action for accountability. So if a brand finds themselves mm -hmm. in a misstep, if a brand finds themselves yeah. in a campaign that doesn't land in the way that they want, mm -hmm. what is, you know, maybe something for us to consider here as far as like, how do you then unstereotype it is what's the system in place internally yes. to have those courageous conversations? First yes. of all, people need to be represented and in the room and in levels of of leadership, mm -hmm. but then how do we also create the space to be uncomfortable when power and privilege is yeah. challenged? I think a big problem is that brands want to have these progressive conversations, but they don't have the infrastructure. They haven't, right. they haven't safety proofed themselves. And how you safety proof yourself is building that campaign with that community. Right. You can't take the image and not have the people within um, your company to build something authentic. It's, and we, we've seen that message um, happen so often where they, they want to have yes. those conversations, but they don't know how, and then it falls short. Yes. And then there's a situation, and then they almost retreat. And it's such a shame if you retreat because you know you've already done the hard work in trying. Right. Um, and You're I think missing that opportunity yes. to learn. Yes, absolutely. It's really important to just build the campaigns with the people mm -hmm. that you're reflecting. You know, you remind me there's going to be some other impact conversations that we experience over this course together. And there is a conversation I was a part of with a brand where they had built a campaign very intentionally to be inclusive of a particular community, but they had almost gone so far down the road in which they built this campaign without involvement from that community, then yeah. invited the community in. And when the community then pushed back and said, hey, this hasn't been considered or this hasn't been considered, the answer was, well, it's already been built. Exactly. Which is not the way we want to build relationships. It's not, and it's counterproductive as well to Correct. spend all of that budget Absolutely. and then it not be the most effective product to put out there. And that I've, I've been in those rooms yes. when that's happened as well, and it never makes sense to me. Right. Because it's, I think that a big problem that brands have is that they don't plug into the services and um, organizations that support marginalized communities. There's so many incredible organizations that are trans-led, that are pushing for change in the yes. industry that can be plugged into, build those campaigns with those organizations, plug into the charities, understand what the, um, un understand what the issues that those communities yes. are facing, and then try to build something that counters that, rather than just going over the same stereotypes of, you know, bathrooms, or it, it's, it's really important that we again, raise the bar when we're talking yeah. about marginalized experiences, that we're not just going around the same distractive um, talking points um, yes, that the, governments are pushing. Or the rah-rah talking points. When we do advising for brands, we often say to avoid SFSN. It sounds fabulous. It signifies nothing. 
Yes. Right? It's just a lot of rhetoric. We recognize it. We feel good about it, but it doesn't mm -hmm. in engage in inclusive and systemic change. We have a couple minutes left, and I have two more questions for you. You have this quote that I love, which is, the future is browner, the future is queer, and the future is non-binary. Could not co-sign that more with all of the research and, and lived experiences that we have out there, but I would love to hear you talk to the brands who that statement might scare. The future is browner, it's queer, it's non-binary. If brands have been maybe hesitant or feel like they've misstepped in, in representing a, a future that looks like that, what would you say to them? I would say that it's in your interest to represent that. Um, if, if you're scared by that, then that should scare you. Mm. Because the way that the world is going is that, you know, the, people are dating and procreating outside of their races. People are identifying in diverse ways that for so long they haven't had the confidence to. People are changing their family dynamics um, in ways that feel authentic to them. People aren't afraid anymore in the ways that they were. And um, I think, you know, the ways that, like when we look at who buys products, mm -hmm. why reduce the reach of your product? Why reduce how many people can use your product when, if you're telling them that it's not for them? Mm. I think it's really important to push a message of inclusivity and inclusion because it should be for everybody. And when you're saying that this product is not for you, then that's financially um, not a sustainable thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we understand that this is for everybody. And this is happening. The toothpaste is out of the tube, y'all. It's not going back in. Well, this exactly. Is the world. <laughs> all of the conversations that we've been having yeah. recently are all for something. That's right. And um, let's heed. Let's heed that. Let's let's keep going. One of the points of our conversation now, and when we talked prior to this, that have really stood stood with me since we spoke was the conversation around dignity and the role that brands mm -hmm. are creating in standing up, advocating for yes. individuals in communities and cultures where governments don't and can't. So I. I want to just spend our last minute together to talking about truly especially in the gravitas of the room that we're in and talking about human rights issues around the world and looking at um, the treatment and the way that consumers are and employees are looking at the brands that they work with and yeah. consume to stand for them mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a minute where brands fit in where governments fail to go well I want to get the example um, in the UK it's not legally recognized to identify as non-binary. You can't have a passport that says that you're non-binary. In America, you can, you can have an X. Um, in India, you can, you can have other, male, female, other. Um, and it's widely just said that there are only two genders, but that's not true when we know that that's not true. But in the, the Western way of thinking is that there are two genders, but the way the Western way of thinking is prioritized and centered as the norm. Um, so governments aren't allowing people to legally recognize as non-binary, even though non-binary people exist and are visible increasingly mm -hmm. so, but companies and industries can be the ones to lead that change. Mm -hmm. Where capitalism has historically been exclusionary, it can now lead that change. It can now show that, you know, governments may not legally recognize you, but we do. Right. We can provide a workplace that is a safe space for you to be in. Um, we can provide a, a workplace that empowers you to be who you are. Um, and I think that that's a really empowering way to look at capitalism, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because obviously it, it isn't always um, that positive. Mm -hmm. um, but we can lead that change. Yes. We, can, um, we can be the change when governments aren't. Yes. And lastly, Sarah mentioned in your long and illustrious intro that you are now a published author. So I want to talk about, just in our last moment, <laughs> your new book, Transitional. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So Transitional is um, a memoir and social commentary um, following my life from childhood to now in terms of why I decided to become an activist, mm. but also everything within my backstory that led me to that point um, from beginning in the fashion industry, well, from childhood to um, beginning in the fashion industry to everything that's happened in the last six years that's mm. been public facing and um, everything that I haven't really talked about before as well, um, but plugging into um, a social context. Uh, for instance, when I was at, um, in high school, it was 
legal to, um, it was illegal, sorry, for teachers to mention um, homosexuality. Um, and we're seeing that happen again in Florida with the Don't Say Gay Bill. Mm -hmm. um, but that was um, implemented by the Conservative government when I was in school, which led to homophobic bullying essentially being sanctioned. Um, and I talk about the, 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 the human cost of that mm -hmm. and how that essentially pr produced um, a generation of queer people with mental health issues and um, issues around shame and self-worth mm -hmm. um, and how we can change things based on the exclusionary systems that are put in place mm -hmm. and how we're now seeing the same thing happen again um, with the trans community, um, especially when it comes to media reporting. Trans people are reported in the UK in the same way that gay men were reported about in the 1980s so we've got a very long way to go yes. um, and this is why it's so important that the imagery um, when yes. it comes to advertising when it comes to fashion which I try to um, make sure that I talk about um, and beauty is progressive and um, counters all of that negative media reporting, yes. counters all of that inaction from governments who don't want to um, do anything when it comes to um, access to safe spaces, healthcare, shelter, um, anything that um, identifies trans people as functioning members of society rather than a drain or um, a potential threat. Um, it's really important that we be the change rather than waiting for um, the people that are, that should be making the change yes. to change things. Indeed. Thank you for your work, for your voice, for your courage, and for your time with us today. Thank We're you so, so much happy to have you here. Me. Thank you, Monroe. Thank you. Start acknowledging country. And when you don't know what's appropriate, just ask. I'm not done yet. Are you? Advertising and media plays a crucial role in influencing behaviours, forming social attitudes and shaping beliefs. With this comes an immense potential progressive portrayal of all people to drive positive change. The questions weren't asked and that was the fundamental problem. And so, you know, brands and people can learn a lot from asking a lot of questions up front. And what we actually need to be doing is actually consulting with community right at the very beginning. Remove the fear, have more yarns, yeah. talk about it, and we'll get there a lot quicker than we think, because it's very possible. Hi, my name is Elda Shukir, and I work for Omnicom Media Group in MENA. What it means to be part of the Unstereotyped Alliance in our organization is that we're serious about this topic, is that we're not scared to surface the problem, and to deal with it. In 2020, the first national chapter launched in the Middle East. Today, the UAE chapter proudly includes 14 members and three allies. To kickstart the work in the UAE, the chapter, in collaboration with Zaid University, conducted a study on stereotypes prevalent in GCC marketing and advertising campaigns. The data from this research formed the basis for the chapter's strategy in its first year. The chapter celebrated its first anniversary in December 2021 at Expo Dubai, 
raising awareness through two panels. The panels featured pioneering leaders and emerging women leaders that collectively joined forces to eliminate stereotypes in the workplace and advance women's leadership representation. The chapter participated in the UN Women SDG5 Summit at Expo Dubai and highlighted the prevalence of harmful stereotypes in media that impede women's advancement in society. A competition was launched inspiring students to challenge the outdated notions about women's roles in society and occupations. The created campaigns were presented by the students during the summit. In collaboration with Mary Claire, the chapter launched a campaign showcasing women leaders and role models across the UAE to exemplify how women are thriving and overcoming stereotypes. As part of Emirati Women's Day 2022, Snapchat and the Unstereotype Alliance launched a collaboration to celebrate Emirati women by introducing a dedicated Snapchat AR lens that showcases the unlimited capabilities of women in the UAE. The results were incredible. Media coverage across 10 renowned media outlets with a reach of over 8.5 million people. All this reinforced the unstoppable drive, motivating the UAE chapter to continue to seek out opportunities to drive positive change across the region. En Unilever, tenemos la convicción de impulsar campañas que promuevan la equidad de género, rompiendo los estereotipos y desafiando los prejuicios de belleza. Nos hemos sumado a un Stereotype Alliance para continuar con la transformación hacia un cambio positivo en la publicidad y plasmar representaciones diversas e inclusivas para las audiencias a las que llegamos. I'm delighted to tell you that Twitter is blowing up, as the kids say, after Munro's uh, conversation with Jess. Isn't she amazing? Um, and for those who are staying on for the summit, you'll have a chance to, um, to see Munro again. Um, she's joining us this evening, so um, yeah, and, uh, and please do follow her. She really is fantastic, and I'm delighted to say we're going to be doing more work with her. So um, very glad she could join us today. We're now going to turn towards the work of the Unstereotype Alliance a bit more and um, discussing the next phase of our strategy as an alliance. So I'm delighted to introduce you to our first panel of speakers. While UN Women convenes the Unstereotype Alliance, we are guided and work very closely with our executive leadership team of vice chairs and deputy vice chairs. They are industry experts who steer the strategy of the alliance set our annual targets and the delivery of outcomes across our four global work streams. Together we track a number of metrics to measure our progress and the impact of our work to create unstereotyped content, foster diversity in the workplace and mobilise public action against stereotypes. One of those metrics is our State of the Industry report, which we are releasing um, tomorrow on our website, the second edition of the State of the Industry report. And against that backdrop, and to discuss the next phase of the Unstereotype Alliance, please welcome to the stage our Deputy Vice Chairs, Heidi Gardner, Dale Green, and Eleni Santos. Yeah. And they are in conversation with our very good friend, the real Seth Rogen. Uh, yes, for those of you who are expecting the other person with my name, I apologize in advance. I'm a walking disappointment sometimes, but I hope that we'll make this worthwhile for you. So good morning. Welcome to my home city that I love. Uh, I am thrilled uh, to be uh, moderating for you today on this panel, uh, not only because this is an important discussion, but because we have three true leaders uh, who are taking real action uh, to talk to you today and to learn from. Um, just to explain my connection, uh, I'm the CEO of Magnolia Media Partners, which is a consultancy firm here in New York uh, uh, and working with companies around the world. But uh, I also serve as an associate fellow at the University of Oxford's uh, Said Business School um, and run, uh, along with one colleague, the Oxford News Marketing Program. Uh, and perhaps most pertinent today, I'm the co-chair of the executive committee of Oxford's Future of Marketing Initiative, where we study 
what the advertising and marketing industry will look like one, five, ten years from now. Um, and in, I also want to recognize that one of the top uh, professors from the school, uh, Professor Rhonda Hadi, is here in the room as well. Um, and we are very proud to say that the Unstereotype Alliance is a, a, a core member of that Future of Marketing initiative. And so thank you so much for including us all today. Uh, today we're going to talk about the experience and guidance of three genuine leaders of this mission to raise the bar on our collective mission. And I mean it when I call them leaders because they're not layers. They aren't just talking about inclusion. They aren't just talking about fighting stereotypes. They are taking action individually and as senior leaders within and advisors within some of the world's most prominent companies. Not only have their companies stepped up to the task of fighting stereotypes, but each has personally demonstrated individual commitment of time, spirit, knowledge, experience, effort, and network to advancing this fight. They aren't waiting for others to take initiative. They're seizing the opportunity themselves. Many of us would like to say that if we got into a position of power, we wouldn't forget where we came from. We wouldn't lose sight of our agency. We wouldn't lose sight of our ability to make change. Uh, we wouldn't shy away from that responsibility. But these three leaders and their organizations are proving with their actions that they are owning this responsibility and inspiringly seizing the moment to make real change that matters in every single one of our lives. So with me are three leaders, uh, Heidi Gardner, uh, Global Culture and Social Impact Consultant at IPG, uh, Dale Green, who is the Global Director of uh, Purpose Marketing at Mars, and Alina Santos, Chief Brand Officer and Chief Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer at Unilever. We need a longer title, but that's good. Uh, so to all of you, uh, the Unstereotype Alliance is now in its fifth year. It has 237 members worldwide and 12 national chapters across five continents. If you're doing the math, that's 830%, 837% growth in five years. We'd all like a business result like that. I'm keen to hear from some of you about your most meaningful observations in that time and what it means to you to be a deputy vice chair of the Unstereotype Alliance. Heidi, why don't we start with you? I had a feeling you were gonna do that. <laughs> um, I, the growth and the, um, the scale of the Alliance is one of the developments that really stops me in my tracks. We reach billions of consumers. We employ millions of people. We have the potential to change the lives of people in entire countries, if you think about it. Um, and to know that all of these companies that have joined with us have signed on to the idea of social progress and having a responsibility for that. Um, and I think if you heard our speakers earlier, you know, shaping the urgency of need. And I want to thank Jaime, my new best friend, for making the trek to Costa Rica, from Costa Rica here, to be with us. Um, the idea that if you looked at the building blocks of progress, being inclusion, right, um, opportunity, correct, and personal freedom, and the idea that we've go we're going backwards, on a number of the foundations for well-being in a healthy society. If you look at them, stereotypes are the underpinnings of them all. And so the last thing that I'm gonna say is we've emerged as a, I think, a rather unique forum where we do, we're not a trade group, we are out here for good and social good, but we have those relationships and we are, I think, doing a really good job of integrating the business imperative with the social imperative. Dale. Yeah, just, just to build on that, you know, I mean, we all believe advertising can influence people. So why can't it influence people for good? You know, and I was talking to my colleague, Alicia, about, she, um, she was at the first global summit. And she goes, gosh, it was a very small room compared to this. And I remember the last one when we were over, over the road in the Hilton, it was a bit bigger. Um, and then look at it now, you know, as you say, that growth that you mentioned, just I mean, it just shows the momentum of how it's going. And 
This is quite a formal setting. I think one of the best things about the Unstereotype Alliance is the peer connections. We're all trying to figure this out. Right five years ago, a few of us were just trying to figure out what does this mean? And the peer relationships you get, the sharing of ideas that you can use tomorrow, the materials now that are now um, available in terms of like the, you know, we've trained over 2,200 associates and agency people with the five Ps principle. Great, thank you. Don't need to work it out, it's there. And so both the combination of materials that are available, but then trying to unpeel this and work out, and you think you've done it, and then you lift another stone, and you go, oh, what about that? What about this? What about the other? But I think it just shows just the amount of people here, just the momentum that this is getting, how serious people are taking this, and the change that we can do through our lives. Isn't it great that you can get out of bed in the morning and actually do something that changes the world? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. What a pinch moment this is to be here. It is incredible. I think that the Unstereotype Alliance, for me, started actually before the Unstereotype Alliance. That was in 2016, when at Unilever we started a movement called Unstereotype. And we started that movement because we noticed that majority of our consumers were not connecting with our advertising anymore. They were not recognizing themselves in the advertising that they were seeing. So there is no way that we could grow a business that people are not connecting. And when we started to understand why they were not connecting, we started to understand how much of stereotypes we still had in our advertising and in the whole industry. So we started to pay attention to that, to put attention to the scripts that we were uh, shooting, to the casting that we were choosing, and we started to see a tremendous change in the reaction from consumers. That reaction was so big that our business started to grow much faster than before because of those changes. And we were so animated with that, that we, th we said to ourselves, this is too good to be just with, within Unilever. We have to share this. The world needs more inclusiveness. The time for inclusiveness marketing is now. So that's when we reached out to UN Women to talk about the findings, the results, and how much we could benefit many other industries if we go into a bigger organization like the Unstereotype Alliance. And that's, and that's what, uh, you know, started um, a year later in 2017. You see, I think it was very timely, because as you remember, 2017 was a very iconic year. It was the year of the expansion of hashtag MeToo, the expansion of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, so there was a lot of momentum, important momentum for big companies to act. And that's what we started. But you know, even in my wildest dreams, I never thought that we were going to be here in this amazing room with so many companies joining in. What I think is super special about the Unstereotype Alliance is not, you know, it is that it's not just a bunch of global people sitting in a room, feeling the same, looking the same. You know, we have the chapters. The chapters, the national chapters, they are really what makes this alliance so special. Because when we think about stereotypes, they are so contextualized. Depend, they depend so much in where you are talking, who are you talking, when are you talking. So I really love the fact that we unfold this alliance in a way that we can really get the granularity of what's happening in each of the countries. And just to conclude, um, I think it is important for any company that is joining the Unstereotype Alliance now to think that this is a serious business. At Unilever, when we started, we started at the highest level. The vice chair of the Unstereotype Alliance is Alan Jope, is our CEO. So we are not talking about the grassroots of the company. The grassroots of the company is already with us because they understand the importance of that. We need the senior leadership of the company to be engaged with this. No seniority no priority. And the other element that I would like to say is that when you embark into this journey, start measuring. As in Unilever, we say we measure what we treasure. And hopefully, Jaime, we are measuring the right things uh, and we are measuring the right progress. But you know, with this kind of a huge journey, 
today we have you know the satisfaction to see our advertising being considered by consumers unstereotypical and this is you know something that makes us super proud and gives us even more ammunition to keep pushing I wanted to say one more thing. How many people were struck by the multiple security points coming in here today? I mean, I, I, it was like you went, the, you, you, you showed your ID to the person here and then you had to show it again. There's a reason for that. There are so many people in the world that do not agree with what the United Nations or UN women stand for or what we are doing that security needs to be there. And then I was walking down the hall, and next to us in the next chamber is where this, the, 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 the UN Security Council meets. And guess who there, and the, I saw a message, um, a, a, a posting of the next meeting to happen, and it was about the, uh, the ambitions of the Russian Federation. To be here, at this time, under the auspices of UN Women and the United Nations, in this forum, when I think about it, is an extraordinary moment and it's an extraordinary opportunity for real impact. Alina, let me ask you about this. When we talk about unstereotyping content, Ad content, we're really talking about inclusion, right? And positive representation of all people, whatever the culture, but you're doing business all over the world. Yeah. And not every consumer in every market has the same view of what inclusion and representation means. It, it may differ by marketplace for the local culture. How do you face that? So what we know is that, um, well, first of all, Unilever is in 190 countries. So indeed, yeah, we are very much spread. But what we know is that 74% of consumers today have a very high expectations about brands. They expect brands to care about social um, issues, especially issues related to inequalities. So they expect a brand to have a point of view. And, um, and, and this has been very much in our favor because we are uh, a company that believes in that, believes in having a point of view, um, and that's what we are trying to do with, with uh, many of our brands. When it comes to the execution, many times we have to cater the execution uh, in a different way depending on the country that we are talking about. So if the execution uh, works for the US, doesn't mean that it will work for a country in Africa and vice versa. So we always adapt, but we are always, in all the cases, pushing the envelope. We are always trying to be as progressive as that society can, uh, can, can retain, can, can contain. And, and that is a, a kind of um, a point that goes across all our brands. So this is something that we have to uh, you know, walk our talk, but also adapt as we go, depending on the context. So Dale, how is unstereotyping as a form of inclusion and representation evolving during your time with this effort? I mean, for instance, we're seeing right now some progress, not enough, in terms of uh, female representation, but what about all the other groups that are looking for representation and aren't feeling that same advancement? Absolutely, I mean, it started with UN Women, it started with gender and equity in that space, and, and it has evolved, you know, I mean, we, at Mars, we have a mantra, we say like, oh, the world we want tomorrow starts with how we do business today. So when we started, we don't actually know where we are in this space. And you mentioned about, Alina, about getting data. So I think the first thing we did, we worked with the Gina Davis Institute, we audited all our advertising. You know, and one of the things was like, the vast majority of our associates in marketing are female. Okay, it's, it's great. Okay, and yet two thirds of the characters in our advertising were men. So it wasn't just that the men were making the ads. Everyone's affected by um, unconscious bias, societal norms, and it was coming through our work. And as we started to get into that and start to look at other groups, uh, there's a tension between focus, but actually making sure you bring all the groups up. So we're making great progress on gender, but we're not there yet. We're making great progress on race, but we're not yet there. We are making progress on disability and sexuality, age, etc. but 
as Sarah mentioned before, nowhere near in terms of true representation of what populations look like out there. And, and it's still a journey to do that, but it's just having the data allows you to confront reality. No one's deliberately trying to um, exclude anybody or be discriminatory, but the data is the data. So, and it's opened up conversations for us, like on Snickers, you know, it's quite a lot of banter, if you're British, you know what that means, uh, on a Snickers, but why does the voiceover have to be a man all the time? You know, are we actually excluding people an opportunity by doing that? You know, call out to Marissa over there and M&Ms, you know, what's the balance of characters? Who's actually doing the speaking? Are we being representative with that? You know, who's round the table? We've got a food business. Who's actually round the table enjoying Ben's Original or other products? And who's in the kitchen? Who's doing the cooking? You know, and, and just confronting that, we're seeing big changes, but yeah, getting the data and being able to track that progress is the biggest thing. And you're doing it across multiple brands. So Heidi, I think of you, you know, working with IPG for all these years. IPG has to be one of the most prominent and important advertising holding companies in the history of the industry. And you're advising, your organization is advising so many different businesses. How do you bring these issues to life with authenticity for each of those brands? Um, I think what I, let me just say that um, what has happened over the last, I was, I was um, I'm sort of semi-retired, yay. Um, from my um, long uh, career with IPG. And what I can say is that uh, th there is more emphasis on getting the data and asking the right questions. You know, when we go to a client, we can't just... Uh, you know, talk about our personal feelings, which we may, which I think need to be a part of the story. I think the it's 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 hard to build on the the film and the films and what Moreau shared and you know the idea of what personal experience means. But one of the biggest changes that I've seen is the investment in data, um, and all of our agencies are coming at. Uh, at, at these issues, I think, somewhat differently in a way that makes sense for them. Um, but I think that's the one of the biggest changes. And I think the other one is that across our company, even, you know, and I've, I, the idea of needing to be more representative, um, and I, I have problems with the idea that uh, the primary ar uh, argument for being more representative is this match the market thing. Uh, I think it limits the value that people bring, and I also think that it can lead to a sense of tokenism. Well, we've got one of those, you know, we've got one of them, and I don't think that's what we're trying to achieve, and I think what we need, what we're trying to achieve is uh, a smartness you know, using data for all of our society and our customer base and not just some, some of them. So I think there was the expectation and that changed a great deal. Um, and, you know, we started doing things like tying certain goals uh, to CEO compensation, you know, something that we started a long time ago. Um, and it's about understanding the needs and expectations. Thank I you. hope that makes sense. Absolutely, but it's, absolutely it does. Dale, I, I want to come questions. Back. Just want to, to, to add this because I think that when you start the, um, to be part of the Unstereotype Alliance and you start to talk about the impact of unstereotyping advertising and your product and your innovation, it's very weird if you do that and you don't do anything about your workforce. So you have to be in tandem. So, you know, it happens in my case that I'm, you know, chief brand officer and chief EDNI officer at Unilever. That helps. But what we created as well is a program to unstereotype the workforce. We created a program to teach leadership, but not the leadership that we were taught when we started in the industry. Leadership that is inclusive. So we trained, the, you know, the top thousand uh, employees of Unilever 
to be inclusive leaders. So I think that all those things, all these facets, they have to happen in tandem. Otherwise, you don't do the movement that you really need to do. You don't see uh, the impact that you need to see. Excellent. And, and Dale, of course, where you spend your money is where you've set your priorities, right? In many ways, it's a manifestation. And so I have to think part of this is about redefining the message. And part of it, not to channel McLuhan too much, though, is, is, the, is the importance of the medium itself, which brands like yours are spending across a number of different kinds of platforms, digital, streaming, linear TV, and the like. What role does media selection play in coming into this in terms of making sure the media itself is inclusive? There are so many brands out there right now in the media world that are looking to misinform or disinform or drive divisions in the world. We all know what they are. And yet we see brands advertising on them all the time, even brands that are well-intended. So at what point does the media consideration come into your strategy? Yeah, I talked earlier about you lift a stone and you find there's more to do. And I would say, you know, my personal journey, I think our journey as a stereotype is focused on content and initially like who's in front of the camera, then how else is that influenced? What's going on behind the camera, et cetera? I think more recently it's like, well, hang on, where are we showing up? And is there actually bias in that? Right from the brief, who are we actually targeting? Are we excluding people? You know, uh, when you get a pen portrait of this is, your, this is who we're going to buy from a media point of view, well, is, has that already set the, the scene of who we're having and who we're not? And who are we, is that money that we're leaving behind as well from a pure business point of view? Is there opportunity there? We all want penetration. Well, don't keep talking to the same people all the time if you want that. And therefore, we started to go on this journey of like, well, what does that mean from a media point of view? Watch who is actually consuming which media? How do we reach them? Do we have a response? We talked about like trillions and trillions of dollars spent in this industry. Well, can we actually put that to some good? Because, you know, it's all very well saying we want minority audiences and maybe they consume slightly different media. But if we don't advertise in them, those media titles aren't going to exist. They won't be sustainable. They won't make money. We have a responsibility to actually put our money behind these areas where we want to actually reach people. And therefore, uh, later on, if you get the chance, one of the um, platforms, the strategic action platforms we'll go into is to unpick this a lot more in terms of what are the things going on? What do we have to consider? What are some of the unintended consequences? Is there bias in algorithms, all sorts of things we'll get into. And we'll unpack that uh, a bit later this afternoon, but we haven't got all the answers. And part of this is, how can we work together to make it better? Alina, I couldn't agree more with what Dale was just saying about the, where, where you spend your money really does have the impact. And yet, I guess this is a preview of the report that you'll share tomorrow. But in the report, uh, there's a reference to a study by Kinetics and Digiday that says 81% of responding companies feel like they're taking action to pursue DEI goals, but only 29% of those same companies said they were actually planning to spend to represent diverse people in their creative. And only 30% said they were planning to spend budget to support that media with diverse ownership. So isn't the budget where the rubber meets the road? I mean, in my mind, we need guidance from the three of you, particularly from you, Aline. You know, what guidance would you give for a company that wants to drive more budget allocation and fight for that internally? Because I think a lot of us here represent companies that want to do better, but we've got to build this case inside the company. So first point, I think, is, is to say that to unstereotype doesn't cost more money at all. You can do whatever uh, you are doing with the same budget that you are doing, and you can be 100% unstereotypical, or you can be 100% stereotypical. You choose. You don't need more money. When you are talking about unstereotyping the work, we are talking about what are the stories we want to tell? Is this the right story? Is this a story just perpetuating old stereotypes that are holding people back? Or are we telling stories that are progressive, that are inspirational for people, that are giving hope to people to be whoever they want to be? This doesn't cost money. When we are thinking about choosing a casting, it's A or B or C or D, it doesn't cost more money. It's just your choice. So the first point that we need to understand is that to unstereotype, you don't need more money. The other thing that you need to understand is that anyone, any specific, you know, a little piece of advertising, even an e-commerce poster that you have or a photo of your product, you can choose that to be stereotypical or not. 
So I think that um, for, for that part, you don't need money. But I tell you where you need money. You need money, and more than money, accountability from the companies that embrace some stereotype to train your people, to train the marketeers, to train your agencies, to train your partners in order they understand the issues that we are confronting here and how to bring solutions. That you need some investment. But honestly, any company that will be represented here in this room today would have the sort of money that we are talking about. So I think that money is off the table. Deal. Uh, just to build on that, and for the marketeers in the room, I'm a marketeer, uh, one little tip is um, if you can align what your brand is talking about to what the corporation also has, not only will that mean you can do it with integrity, and you know, but also you'll get more stakeholders engaged, you'll get more momentum internally, and you might be able to tap into their budgets as well as your own. So just a little tip there in terms of, it's not just the marketing budgets, it's actually the whole business's budget. And can you actually get everything to align in the same direction? Heidi, I want to come to you on this. Okay, oh, you... Go right ahead. Okay, I wanted to build on that because um, at marketers, agencies, media companies have a vested interest in the well-being of this virtuous circle of their customers, their employees, the communities where they are. And as far as I know, every company in here has said we're on board to, for sustainable development, which is economic, social, and environmental. That's the only reason we're here. Um, and if you want to think on a practical level, you can't foster the well-being of your employees, their families, their communities, if, if you're not representing everyone with dignity and respect, that's the basis you know, for the progress that we need to have. And if you're a company working really hard internally to create those opportunities and you know, challenge the, the, the norms for who's doing what, and then you send your employees outside and your, the media environment is polluted with the exact opposite norms you're trying to change. It's like what my grandma used to um, say, uh, you're spitting in the wind. <laughs> you know, you're working against yourself. All right, I know we're gonna run short on time, so um, I have one last question for all of you, which is, because what you really talked about, Heidi, was creating that context for growth, which you and I have discussed before, right? One of my favorite CEOs in this business said, it's not the job of a CEO to demand people do work. People already know that when they show up. It's to create the context for people to achieve great things. And so when you have that senior leadership, it really does come across. And so for the three of you, before we go, uh, everyone who's here is investing their time, and everyone who's watching at home all around the world is investing their time, their spirit, their energy in this issue. What advice would you give them, and what challenge would you give them? Alina, maybe we start with you. I think I'm going to um, repeat myself a little bit, and um, it's good to repeat. Um, I think that uh, wh what I would say is um, no seniority, no priority. So engage with the senior leadership of your company. Make them understand the importance of that. If you don't have their hearts, have their uh, pockets, because the stereotype <laughs> of business is a business that pays off, that gives fantastic results for the company. Second point is about measuring what you treasure. This is phenomenal. This is important. We cannot uh, progress without knowing what is our baseline. We cannot judge. We cannot identify gaps and, uh, and uh, hot spots. So it's very important to measure what you treasure. And the third one, uh, for God's sake, you know, we are in such a privileged uh, space. We have to be united with governments, NGOs, all of us together, the world out there needs our help. And the private sector is the one who has the knowledge, has the budget, has the capabilities. So I would say step up because it's our time. Yeah. Um, ditto to all of that. I won't repeat that. Absolutely. Especially the data one. Um, my, my other thing would be uh, fear. I think one of the challenges is fear. You know, 
no one gets fired for being mediocre. Yeah, but you're not going to make a difference by doing that either. So even if it means starting small, testing it, testing it with different communities to check it's right, build that muscle both for yourself and the organization that actually this can actually work and it can make a difference. It can not only just do good, you can grow your business off the back of this. So I just watch out for that, you know, not wanting to stick your head up above the parapet. It's only when people do that other people will follow and as a movement we'll get momentum on this. Heidi, please. I'm going to I'm kind of keep thinking about the, the 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 through line here around sustainable development, the idea of leaving no one behind, which is sort of the uber theme of um, the sustainable development goals and um, you know the, our goals today which are raising the bar to accelerate change and I'm not sure I, you need to know where your bar is and if you have if you don't know where you're starting it's pretty hard to decide you know where you are um, raising the bar the other thing is I'm just going to reiterate all of most of our leaders our boards um, uh, other C-suite members, our ch chief financial officers, have all embraced, for the most part, this idea of ESG or, you know, and, and, and human capital. And my argument is that if you are not integrating these issues or you want to talk about diversity, inclusion, informed marketing, into all of your business processes, then you're not going to succeed. And if you're not embracing these partnerships, um, and when you do that, you are able to engage the other stakeholders who have to come to the table with the resources. Well, I think that's a, a great way to finish. You know, we live in a moment where face-to-face -face interaction has been reduced. We live in a moment where objective news has been greatly reduced. Um, we have to fight the impulse to be reductive in the way we see each other. Mm -hmm. And we also, as much as this is a challenging time, right, economic mobility is reduced. And yet, we also sit here at a time where technology can connect us and data can help us to understand each other and actions from people like you can actually make a difference. So thank you to these three leaders, thank you to all of you, and I look forward to a great rest of the day in the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. En el 2022, ONU Mujeres lanza en la Argentina el capítulo nacional de una iniciativa mundial, The Unstereotype Alliance. Esta iniciativa promueve la eliminación de los estereotipos dañinos en los medios de comunicación, como también en la publicidad, en alianza con los actores claves de toda la industria, anunciantes y organizaciones sociales. Armamos una mesa de trabajo colaborativa y definimos estos objetivos. Primero, eliminar en la comunicación publicitaria omnicanal los estereotipos de género que sean dañinos. Esto implica revisar las comunicaciones en redes sociales, medios tradicionales, puntos de venta y el comercio electrónico. Segundo, fomentar la representatividad de las personas usando un enfoque interseccional para abordar las desigualdades profundamente arraigadas. ¿Cómo lo lograremos? Trabajamos en tres ejes. A través de entrenamientos intensivos e innovadores, vamos a equipar a los y las profesionales de la comunicación publicitaria con datos y herramientas para poder identificar los estereotipos en las comunicaciones. Una de las herramientas claves que estaremos trabajando es el marco de las 3 P. Esto es una serie de pautas para aplicar en todo el proceso creativo y así colaborar con la mejor representación de las personas. Sabemos que la evidencia abre ojos. Por eso, como primer paso, estamos haciendo una investigación utilizando el marco de las 3P de Unstereotype Alliance para analizar las publicidades ganadoras de los premios más representativos y prestigiosos de nuestro mercado para detectar la presencia de estereotipos dañinos. Y como próximo paso vamos a implementar y difundir la Unstereotype Metric que desarrolló ONU junto con Kantar para entender cuán progresiva o regresiva es la representación en la publicidad. Con estas dos iniciativas creemos que vamos a dar grandes avances porque confiamos en que para cambiar una realidad del primer paso es hacer visible cuál es el problema. Para tener resultados diversos, definitivamente hay que tener equipos diversos. Primero vamos a trabajar en contar qué hace la alianza. Cuanto más empresas se sumen, mayor impacto vamos a lograr. El objetivo definitivamente es impactar en toda la cadena creativa publicitaria. La Argentina es uno de los países de la región 
que más ha liderado cambios sociales y culturales desde la perspectiva de género, desde la diversidad y desde la inclusión. Sin embargo, hoy aún tenemos presentes creencias culturales en nuestra sociedad a las cuales debemos sacarle el velo. Y es por eso que estamos acá. Creemos en el potencial de la comunicación en todas sus formas, pero en especial el de la industria publicitaria, de repensarse, de cuestionarse y de aprender para promover una mejor realidad para todas las personas. All right, I'm deeply concerned about our blood flow. Does anybody need to stand up? Do you need to shake it out? Feel free to do so. Just want to give you a good breath. Okay, um, so, yes, yeah, so we have found a, f oh, never mind that announcement. We had a lost phone and then we found it. So, on to even better news. Um, as you know now, the UN connection to the Unstereotype Alliance underscores the importance of the collective action of our membership to help to achieve those sustainable development goals, uh, the SDG 5, as you've heard, for gender equity, and the SDG 10, to reduce inequality within and among countries. The theme of our summit this year, as you know, is raising the bar, and we're challenging ourselves and our members to drive greater social impact and accountability through the power of their work. Uh, in alignment with the UN Women's Strategic Plan for 2022 through 2025. This is then how we will report our work and how it gets reported as progress against those SDG 5 goals. So over the next two days, the un members of the Unstereotype Alliance will discuss some of our key areas of focus for those next couple of years. And this afternoon, as Dale mentioned, we're gonna be diving in deeper to three strategic action platforms that give us a huge opportunity to really shift uh, and move the needle when it comes to driving positive change. So in order to give you a little preview of those uh, SAPs, we love acronyms around here, we're gonna focus on highlighting three lightning keynotes that will help set the scene describe the problem and demonstrate how the Alliance will work as a collective to make an even greater impact. First up in these lightning keynotes is why inclusive media matters. And if we want our advertising to be more representative, it's not just about the content we create, but also where it's seen and by whom, as you just heard from this panel. And as an industry who makes media intended to be more inclusive, uh, how do we target who do we target? How do we affect and look at our bias in media buying? And where do we decide to advertise or not advertise? So to give you a little bit more flavor of these key issues and the discussion that's to come, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Rachel Lowenstein from Mindshare, and she's here to explain why inclusive media matters. Welcome, Rachel. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Lowenstein. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm the global head of inclusive innovation at Mindshare, which means I help brands think critically and creatively about how they use media, marketing, and technology for social good. So I'm going to talk today about the power of inclusive media and how we can be more intentional with our investments as an industry uh, for good growth. Now it goes without saying, but there is no shortage of problems in our world today. And increasingly, as our speakers before me have spoken about, there's an expectation for brands to be solving these problems. Uh, as the inimitable Monroe said, you know, it's partially because governments in many ways are acting in a very regressive way. Just in the US, we are seeing ongoing attacks on bodily autonomy rights, queer rights, racial equity. Uh, and because the public sector is acting somewhat regressively in many parts of the world, there's this expectation for the private sector to step in. But I also think that consumers are just becoming more literate in the ways that brands oftentimes, and maybe in some cases, contribute to these problems. The disinformation crisis, the climate crisis, uh, media outlets shutting down, the funding of journalism. So I think at the very least, we all might agree that some of these problems have become too unwieldy to expect that we don't at least need an evolution to how we've used maybe our best weapon in advertising, which is purpose. I think if you think about the whole concept of purpose, it's an end state, right? And you can't reach that end state without intentional behaviors. So I think instead of advertising with purpose, we instead need to be acting with intention today. 
the whole concept of uh, intentionality and the whole philosophy behind it is that it's a means to an end. It's a way to manifest your beliefs. And I think that's exactly what advertisers need to be doing today to put intentionality, not just purpose, at the center. Now, ooh, this got a little messed up, uh, but that's okay. Uh, this is a quote that usually says, uh, well done is better than well said. And I think creative representation is undoubtedly important, right? I'm, I'm an autistic woman. I rarely see myself represented in media in a positive way. Um, so creative representation is half of the story. The other half of it is how we are behaving, how we are acting as a brand or a business. And a lot of that is wrapped up in the economic power of media. Um, a number of my fellow speakers have spoken about this. We control a third of a, a trillion dollars in paid media spend globally. That's a lot of money that we are leaving on the table to not be acting more inclusively, investing with intention uh, for people who historically have been marginalized by media, not just in our creative, but also in our paid media investments. Um, so typically, you know, we, we look at this uh, world of inclusive media and intentional media, and we see a lot of problems wrapped up in it. I think one of the ways that we've seen this come to life is through the pandemic. Um, typically on, on this slide, and I apologize for the formatting errors here, we show a bunch of COVID ads, right? Like right at the beginning of the pandemic, every brand came out with really beautiful purpose anthems calling for unification and to come together and to take care of one another. But at the same time, we were blocking COVID content from showing up next to our same ads. I think another example of this is We've very happily, you know, alongside with the Unstereotype Alliance and a number of other industry organizations have been pushing for more diverse representation in our ads, which is amazing and we should still do that. But most of our paid media investment goes to very patriarchal and oftentimes white institutions. And in the same swing, uh, there are a number of pay gap issues in the influencer industry, not only along racial lines, but also along gender ones as well, although 80% of influencers and creators are girls and women. Now, this doesn't just, uh, isn't just limited to the world of human biases. This also affects algorithmic biases as well. There's been a number of research studies that show that a lot of DSPs and pretty much every social platform discriminates in their targeting strategies across pretty much every facet of diversity, saying that a certain type of person is more relevant for a product or a service, or in some cases, jobs and housing. And I know it's really uncomfortable to hear, but if anybody said any of these things in the real world, you would definitely find them problematic at best or potentially illegal at worst, uh, but insights like you're old, so you wouldn't like this cool tech product are essentially the foundation of how a lot of digital targeting uh, functions today. And there's been a number of investigations that have found along the lines of algorithmic biases that brand safety technology and keyword exclusion lists are also contributing to this problem when used irresponsibly. Uh, a number of investigations have found that words that are relevant to the queer community, the black community, are ranked equal on keyword exclusion lists to words like shooting, drugs, porn, or killing, which is pretty detrimental and damaging effects to the journalism industry at large. Now, these problems are fixable, right? These aren't problems that are too unwieldy that we can't solve. There's a number of different brands, many of them here in the room today, uh, Unilever, Mars, who are actively acting with intention with their business. I think Sephora is one of those, uh, another one of those examples. Everything that they do is in service of acting for their purpose to make all types of folks feel beautiful, um, not just in their creative, but in every brand and media behavior. Uh, their influencer strategy is predicated on diversified influence to make sure that influencers are reflective of their core customer base. They have makeup classes for trans, non-binary, and disabled people in their stores, and they've updated their loyalty program to allow people to donate to black justice coalitions. So I think we need to redirect our energy because energy flows where our intention goes, and I think it's just fundamentally incorrect to say that the media industry just buys and places ads today. Uh, we are no longer just our madmen advertising elders. Every decision that our industry makes has very material impacts on the world today. And interestingly, I think if you look to another industry, you probably can find 
some signs of inspiration, and that other industries may be sometimes just as disliked or mistrusted as the ad industry, and that is the finance industry. Things like impact investing in the finance industry are becoming more and more normalized, where people are investing their dollars into companies who do social good, and I actually think the media industry can take a lot of inspiration from that. Now, this isn't just a question of morals, it's also an imperative for business. I think if you think about the history of brand growth from the last 10 years, uh, as more and more digital advertising has been at the center of it, a lot of it, maybe with unintended consequences, has been focused on very short and cheap efficiencies. And that's been the direct cause of things like the disinformation crisis, because unfortunately, the larger industry made it profitable. But luckily, the reality of brand longevity could not be any different. People are demanding that brands act with diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just in their creative, but every part of their business, including media. It's attracting talent or maybe detracting talent from your organization. Uh, a lot of money is wasted in the misinformation economy every year. And more and more people say that they wouldn't buy a product if they know a brand was acting in a regressive way. So that's the whole philosophy behind this idea of intentional media that we as an agency um, are really driving with our clients and in partnership with a number of our partners. Media buying is not just transactional anymore. Just buying and placing ads maybe is the most rudimentary form of our business, but every decision that we make as an industry, again, has very material impacts on the real world. So I think that our industry is at an inflection point. We can just ignore that power that we wield or we can embrace it and reshape society for good. Now, there are some core principles of intentional media that we talk about with our clients that I think everybody can lean into. Obviously, it will be different for every brand, business, or category, but broadly speaking, uh, the first is that moral decisions and business decisions cannot be decoupled today. They are fundamentally uh, intrinsically linked. You know, consumers are demanding it, but we also know that more and more sources of growth will come from diverse people. We also firmly believe that media has the economic weight to manifest change, and creative messages are incredibly important, but they're only half of the equation. We also believe that brand safety must be inclusive of human safety. I think a lot of the ways that the brand safety industry has talked about uh, protecting brands online has unfortunately maybe an un unintentionally ignored the human impact of a lot of editorial content. So increasingly, we think we should think about human safety, not just brand safety. Uh, this is intended to be not just in an isolated way because isolated change creates isolated impact and we need to be as broad as possible when applying these ideas. Um, this is an enhancement to media. This isn't a departure from it. You know, I oftentimes say my job title of inclusive innovation is very purposeful and intentional. If you're thinking about innovation, inclusion should be as a part of that. And then finally, um, regardless of who you're working with on your purpose marketing, intentional media, you should always uh, push your agency partners and your partners in general to take your core values as a company and help translate that into your media and marketing behaviors uh, at large. So there's a number of different activations and things that we've done as an agency that we'll talk a little bit later on in, in the breakout sessions. We've worked on a number of projects to help fund journalism for historically marginalized people in direct response to algorithm bias. We've created human safety tools to directly evaluate the impact of our media buys on uh, marginalized folks, uh, specifically the black community. So we're able to actually understand when we're investing our ad dollars, this is the impact that it might be having on this group from a positive down to a toxic way. And then finally, we're also looking at mitigating bias in our targeting strategy with some work that we've been doing with IBM, which we're more than happy to share with you uh, at a later time or in our breakout sessions. So I believe that's all I have for you today. Uh, very fast moving and quick hitting, but hopefully you learned a little bit about how you can be more intentional with your media investments. Thank you. Fantastic, Rachel, and I know that we're looking forward to digging more into this and our strategic action plans later. Next in our lightning series of talks, how can we leverage our employees as our superpower? So as we've heard a lot today, as trusted institutions and leaders begin to fall, trust in ordinary people is rising, and our employees are the most amplified and trusted voices that we have access to. When 93% of people trust what their friends and families say about brands and companies, what can we learn from a complementary 
industry strategy like employee advocacy, corporate social advocacy, and employee engagement efforts to help scale our social impact and the unstereotype mandate, moving from millions of our employees to billions of our employees worldwide. So here to get us thinking a little bit more about that is Emily Caruso from United Minds, and she's going to be speaking about employees as our superpower. Welcome, Emily. Hi, Emily. Uh, very excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am looking forward to talking a little bit on the topic of advocacy, ac activism, and the power of the individual, the power of your collective employees. So to start, the concept of mobilizing and engaging people is not new. For centuries, employees have been activated on a variety of issues, and they've made really significant uh, progress in workplace conditions and advancing technology. But what has changed over the last couple of decades specifically is the power of media, so why this group is here today. The individual now has far more reach than they ever have in, in the history, and in fact, the individual can make a lot of, uh, can really push the ways that companies think about not only their business, but how they engage with society. In 2014, United Minds, which is a, a, a consultancy that focuses on employee engagement, culture change with the purpose of making business more human, uh, noticed that a lot of companies were starting to engage their employees as advocates for the brand. So as, as Jennifer mentioned, or sorry, as Jess mentioned, um, employees are the most trusted source of information about a brand. So in 2014, we found in North America specifically, Nearly nine out of 10 employees were already using social media, uh, and one in three employees were posting without being asked about their organization and, and a, in a variety of ways, both positive and negative. Today, we know uh, that that number is actually 4.7 billion people are on social media, and seven people per second are adding a new account. So this is a hugely untapped network. And again, your organizations represent you know, millions of people that could be engaged in a positive way. And when compared to brand messaging, when an employee shares on their platforms, it goes 10 times further. However, we've also seen a pretty big shift in the last couple of years around employee expectations. And a lot of these themes have already been discussed today, and they track general consumer expectations too. No longer is it okay for companies to be talking just about the issues that impact their business. They also have to have a position on the topics that impact their society, impact society which are the topics that impact their people. And it's also just not just enough to, uh, to be speaking about this. Taking action is the critical step in earning the, the trust and the opportunity to then speak about uh, these separate issues. Further emphasizing the point the, that, uh, that of the expectation of companies to be engaged around societal issues is the fact that it's not just about employees, it's about all of the stakeholders that you care about. Consumers are basing their decisions on where and how to buy based on what you're saying um, and how you're representing your company. Employees are, are holding you accountable for walking the talk on the commitments that you make. And leaders are looking at all of these different dynamics and, and recognizing the importance of employees as a, as a community to be not only um, talking to, but engaging in the solution for a lot of these challenges. I think another really important piece to look at as well is uh, we're not just talking about statements. Again, I mentioned this a couple of times. Action is really important and the results um, are also pretty stark. So over 70% of employees feel like uh, an investment in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion not only has reputational effects, but also helps with key business metrics like uh, recruitment, retention, and uh, ultimately financial, the financial uh, uh, value of the company overall, the return on investment. But inherently there is a risk. So uh, again, lots of statements out there, lots of commitments, but one in two employees don't believe that what employ employers are actually doing matches what they're saying. 
So let that sink in a little bit, especially as you are, uh, th this cohort is responsible for portraying your organization externally to, to all stakeholders. And then, again, back to the theme of action, one in three uh, employees think that companies need to be doing more to advance racial equity and combat systemic racism. So what does that actually mean for this group and what should you be thinking about as you work, go into your, your breakout sessions? I think a couple of key things are really important and the first is getting back to the theme of data, right? Um, you have to truly understand where the risks lie within your organization and then you have to, to develop plans to address those risks. So what are the barriers to employee satisfaction? What are your policies that may not be supportive of the positions that you're taking ex externally? So we talked about the don't say gay bill. We've talked a little bit about uh, the Dodd ruling. So lots of companies were going out and making statements that resonated with their people, but when their people actually looked at um, you know, reproductive health access um, and, uh, and inclusive parental leave, they weren't necessarily seeing their company actually support the statements that were, they were saying with their actions. So that's where uh, a, a really strong, incredible plan that hopefully engages people in the development is, is truly important. So it's not enough to, to understand what your gaps are. You also have to do the work to address them. And I think people are willing to, uh, to engage with you and partner with you and, and suspend disbelief for a little while as long as they are seeing progress being made. Then when it comes to actually mobilizing people, and I think where this, this cohort has a really strong advantage, is having a very clear ask that is aligned to values and mission. So, um, so in order to make sure that your people can advocate for you, they have to believe in what you're advocating for yourselves. And then finally, you have to take a look at some of the barriers to engagement. So um, very tactically, what are the social media policies that your company has? How are you identifying possible uh, people that are engaged in meaningful ways and have large communities that you might mobilize as part of an ambassador network or a champion, ch champion network? So the final thought that I'll leave you with today in my, my lightning round is the power of community. So this has come up a couple of times as well. In all of the research that we've done over the last several years, what we continually see is when you're talking about employee engagement and satisfaction, if, if your employees are involved in some sort of community, be it a business resource group, an employee resource group, an action committee, uh, they, they report higher uh, satisfaction across pretty much every metric when it comes to employee engagement. And we also know that more satisfied employees are more likely to be advocates for the company. So uh, as, as we head to the breakouts, one thing to think about is this as a community is a very engaged community. How, what are the ripple effects? How can you bring back the engagement that you're feeling here today? into your own organizations to be mobilizing your people around this, this shared and common mission. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion have become terms fairly ubiquitous within our industry, and yet, to be candid and to ground us back into the urgency of this issue, we've yet to, uh, to see some of the um, effects that we're looking to impact with the Unstereotype Alliance. So this is where we get to raise the bar and go a little bit deeper and push a little bit further today. Equity is a human right, and it's essential to creating a fair industry. Um, and if we hope to achieve equality and inclusion as an outcome, we have to go even deeper in this conversation. So joining us to explain that equality isn't equal, equity is, I wanna welcome back Unilever's Alini Santos. Welcome, Alini. Hello again, everyone. What a pleasure to be back here. I was just reflecting. You know, I, I was born 
on the 10th of December. Anyone knows what day is this? Human Rights Day, yes. And my mom, who passed away, I think she wished that, that her daughter was going to be a great voice, a great activist to help this world become a little bit better. It is really a pinch moment for me to be here. And thank you so much for everyone who joined virtually and physically. What we are dealing these two days is something very, very important and very dear for me, and I think very dear to anyone who loves this world that we live in. What I'd like to do is to talk about how the Unstereotype Alliance has inspired myself, inspired Unilever, to create an even bigger ambition for our company. And now, what we want it to be is a beacon of equity. And when we brought equity as a concept for Unilever, that was something new, something that people didn't know exactly what it was. When you think about equality, equity, they sound very similar, but they are not. If I use an analogy to explain the difference, Equality is like giving all of you the same pair of shoes. Equity is when I give the same pair of shoes, but I make sure that each of you have the right size. I am a five and a half, okay? I don't know what is your size, but maybe, yeah, very few of you are five and a half. And that is the difference. Remember my shoes, yeah? When you think about equity, we need to fit your foot. And, um, and that is the story that I wanted to tell you today. But to explain the same difference with a different analogy, I have a film that we used for the Women's International Day this year in 2022 that I'd like you to watch. So if we can play the film, please. We're all born equal. That the person never discriminated against because of the color of their skin, their gender, their sexuality, body, or mind. We've all got the same opportunities and obstacles. Said someone who has never had to choose between speaking up or moving up, coming out or fitting in, career or kids. It's easy to say one size fits all when it fits you. That's why equality isn't equal. Equity is and why Unilever is working to unstereotype our policies and practices to create a more equitable and inclusive world. How this film, <laughs> thank you. How this film makes you feel. You know, every time I watch it, it gets me. It gets me because it reminds me of, you know, my own journey as yeah, someone from Latin America, a woman, I'm from Brazil, and having you know, all the challenges of working in a global European company. But also gets me, more importantly, because I know that there are millions of people that are seeing this steep mountain ahead of them, and we need to help them. We need to create a sense of urgency to change that. So at Unilever, what we are trying to do is to create something that is sustainable, that is systemic, that can really go by itself. It doesn't depend on passionate leaders. It's something that really changes the way we operate as a company. And we believe that this has to be holistic and it has to be intersectional. So we decided to start with four buckets. There are many buckets. When you talk about equity, there are so many facets. But we decided to start with these four. First, with our workforce, our talent, our people, our employees. Secondly, with our brands that reach out to 3 billion people every day. Thirdly, about the communities, how we are creating impact in the communities that we touch. And fourth, we wanted to also make supply chain something that is much more diverse than it is today. So let's start uh, with uh, people. When we're thinking about people, 
and we think about the global policies that a big corporation has, those policies were written some time ago. And at that time, nobody was thinking about equity. Nobody was thinking about underserved communities. Everybody had a very clear kind of perception of a certain group, but not all the groups, groups that are not minorities, but yet underserved. And what we are trying to do now is to really shake this. We are trying to reassess every global policy that Unilever has and rewrite them from the eyes of equity. And we have you know, four lenses that we are applying more uh, forcefully. We want those policies to be right in terms of gender, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of people with disabilities, in terms of race and ethnicity. And actually, what we are trying to do is simply to level up our playing field for our people, as simple as that. The second bucket is, of course, brands. And of course, yeah, you all know about the work that we are all doing on a stereotype. This is something that is very, very uh, important for us. We are not only thinking about how we stereotype advertising, but we are also thinking about how we stereotype our products, how we think about the suppliers that are behind the camera when they are shooting uh, our films. It's a much broader uh, spectrum. We wanted to have a mirror of society in the way we are as Unilever, but also the way we represent people in our advertising. And today, 95% of the advertising from Unilever is considered unstereotypical by consumers. And the 5% that is still not, we either shut it down or we change it in order that can become unstereotypical. The third aspect uh, is uh, really how this comes uh, you know, into life and how this is a blend between brand and um, communities. So I'm going to show you uh, an example from a very dear brand, the Dove brand, and how they are working to break stereotypes. So let's have a look. Dad always told me that I should love my hair. So I did even when it wasn't easy. My dad always told me that I should fight for my hair. So I am. Again, how this film makes you feel. How this film makes you feel to know that there are still lots of people that are not allowed to wear their hair in the natural way or whatever way they want to wear. That they cannot walk into school, they cannot walk into some workplaces. So for me, it hurts, it hurts. And uh, I don't need to be from the same underserved community to have empathy for what they are going through. So what we are doing here in terms of community equity is doing uh, something a little bit more elaborated. What we are doing here uh, is to create something that we call the Crown Act, a respectful open world for natural hair. This is a coalition of many companies and what we're trying to do is to change the legislation. We created a piece of new legislation where people have the freedom to wear their hair the way they wanted to wear and they are not prohibited to enter in spaces anymore. And with this piece of legislation, we are going state by state in this country, and we have won already in 16 states, including New York, the right of this legislation to be operative. And uh, you know, uh, we are not going to stop till we have all the states uh, with the same uh, situation where people have total freedom to be whoever they want to be and wear their hair the way they wanted to wear it. So that is about how you impact communities. And last but not least, uh, it's about supply chain. UN gave me a number that I was shocked. This number was that only 1% of the world supply chain go to women-owned business. Can you believe that? So this is something that we are really shaking at Unilever as well. And we have a commitment to invest two billion in underserved groups. We need to have more suppliers, more partners that are coming from underserved communities. 
And one example that we have is another brand from Unilever called Shea Moisture. And here what we are doing is uh, creating a campaign called the, the Next Black Millionaire Fund. Uh, this is something that we are granting you know, 100K for companies that have amazing ideas, but they don't have a way to start. And potentially they are going to become uh, million dollar companies and definitely Unilever partners as well. So these are the four areas of equity that I wanted to, uh, to take you through. I think that there's loads that we need to do. My urge for all of you is to embrace equity. But I think that you also need to recognize that to make change, it takes courage, it takes a lot of work, it takes patience, it takes resilience. But you know what? It pays off. And the impact of the Unstereotype Alliance is unmistakable, absolutely unmistakable. And I think that, you know, with all the presentations you're going to see today, you are going to be more convinced every minute. But what I would like to, to leave you with is that for every unstereotypical action you take, this is going to be pushing people to become more tolerant, pushing people in society to be more inclusive. For every stereotypical action that we take is a reminder for the world to have more empathy and love. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alini. And now to deliver our final remarks and to close out our plenary session, I want to welcome to the stage the former head of the United Nations Trust Fund and Violence Against Women, and now UN Women's Chief of Multi-Stakeholder Partnerships and Advisory Services, Aldiana Chichik. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon in this room and wherever you are in the world. And very hard to stand here after all of those speeches. So just to show you how hard that is for me, this is my original speech. I, I, don't, I don't know if you can see that, but it all started well this morning. I thought I knew exactly what I'm going to say. Things keep changing by minute. So uh, Deputy Vice Chairs of Unstereotype Alliance, members, um, colleagues, friends of UN Women and Unstereotype Alliance, it is really great pleasure to speak with you after such an inspiring, as I said, you've seen my notes, thought-provoking um, discussions. Your personal commitments, your passion, the issues you have shared from your professional and personal capacities, it's really overwhelming. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning of this session, uh, Dan spoke about that. Uh, this chamber um, at the United Nations is reserved for innovative thinking and debate or economic issues, social, cultural, health matters, and the human rights and fundamental freedoms that define us all as people in every corner of the world, globe, every race, ethnicity, gender, ability, sexuality, religion, age, socioeconomic status, and much more. So it's not really generally because it's member states room, it belongs to member states, it, it belongs to 193 member states and their names are removed actually from, from these uh, plaques to put the name of Unstereotype Alliance. Um, it is not usually where we meet with private sector or the media or guests. Well, this is where, where this whole scrapping of the notes comes into it. I believe it should be. I believe that must be. Discussions like the ones that you've just started having this morning are simply just the best and clear reason why. No? Not to mention that, as Alina says, Unilever is present in 190 countries. Well, we need you to be present in three more to match all the member states, which is 193. This morning really provided an excellent and amazing springboard for the next day and a half that you'll be having here and discussions that um, all the members of Unstereotype Alliance and our friends and you from colleagues from your system as well will be having um, here and with that marking the next generation of successes of the Alliance. And as uh, many of you said this morning, including Sarah, um, after five years, we must now challenge ourselves. We must raise the bar 
on the outcomes and on the impact of the alliance and that what it delivers around the world. Um, and you've, I think you have all just had a flavor of what's coming up in, a, in, a, in the rest of the time uh, that you will spend here. And I'm really excited uh, about the potential that I see and hear in discussions here. Uh, and I'm extraordinarily and personally, professionally happy that we do have a partners like this with, with whom we will be delivering that and trying and working together to achieve all of that. Um, as, as I was introduced, I, I lead the multi-stakeholder partnerships and advisory section at UN Women, uh, which encompasses the under, under, did I just say under? Unstereotype Alliance Secretariat and its amazing team led by Sarah. Can we please just have one round of applause for the team and for the Sarah? Because it is not just this that you're seeing here is what is their work, but it's everything that's been happening with Unstereotype Alliance, all the support and coordination. So I can't, sorry, sorry, I know I put you on the spot, but I can't just ignore that. Um, so we work uh, uh, in this work on multi-stakeholder partnership. We work with many partners, with many groups and constituencies. That includes member states or governments, civil society, public sector, trusts, philanthropy, foundations, academic institutions, and of course, the private sector. We are all united in that one absolute belief that the only way we achieve equality for all is by joining forces and working all together and leaving no one behind. No woman, no girl, no man behind. Because ladies and gentlemen, I do, when we speak about stereotypes, I do want to have, I do want to see the right of men to cry. I do want to see the right of men to enter this very chamber in a skirt, just as I do today in my pants. So when we speak about gender equality, let's not forget the stereotypes are not just about a woman, but they're also about a man. How we bring our men and boys, how we, I images that we place in their heads as they're growing up through the video games or as they're growing up through just watching the serial advertising, it is what is building the next generations of people around the world. And many statistics have been highlighted. That's the part I've scrapped. I, I'm not going to repeat them because everybody has said many of them. But I will highlight one important thread that comes through it. Ladies and gentlemen, everything intersects with gender. Everything. Or our lived experiences, all our challenges, our progress, and our collective success. But let me make one thing clear. Gender equality is not a journey. The race for achieving sustainable development goals and gender equality is an urgent must do today thing. We do not have time for journeys and travels anymore, and especially not to achieve something that is already given to all of us, human rights. It's simply fact. A human, gender equality is just human right for us all. So we can't take the leisurely place of traveling to the time because we have lost so much time already. I do appreciate statistics that have been brought today about 200 something years. I don't want that. I simply refuse to believe in that. I mean, that's great, but I want something achieved in my lifetime. I want something achieved in the life of my children, my grandchildren. So therefore, I do not accept that statistic. I accept it as a fact but I don't accept it as an unchangeable fact or unchallenged fact. When you commit to gender equality and partnership, when you become member of an stereotype, when we become members of a stereotype alliance, we forfeit the right to be ambivalent about gender equality and to just have a passive commitment. We fulfill right to just stand by and accept those facts and statistics as the facts and not try and change them. So I'm very proud of this coalition around the world and all of other individuals who are joining us in that challenge of those statistics. So I throw the challenge to all of us to challenge the statistics, to change them. Because they might be today, but hey, 
Let's change them so they're not tomorrow. And so I take this opportunity in this very, very important chamber to remind all of us, be mindful of influence you have. Be mindful of power relations. Be mindful and ask yourself, who is not at your table? How can we change that? One of the fires I just spoke about it. It's not about making mistakes. We all make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, what do we do with it and how we change it so it doesn't happen next time? And how we then use that experience to educate ourselves as well as others. How can we change that statistic of 260, 70, whatever years sometime and move it faster? As members of Unstereotype Alliance, you have unrivaled, you have unrivaled reach and influence to eliminate stereotypes from your advertising, from your messages. But we also, all of us individually, are communicators. We all live lives. We are all broadcasting, curating messages on a daily basis from our offices, from our sofas, from during our breakfast time, during our dinner time, in a park with our children, whatever. And we all have a danger, are in danger, of recreating biases and stereotypes through our messaging and through our own communicating. And we have that at our hand every year, every, every time. How many of you have your phones right now? And how many of you have just tweeted Facebook or Instagram, or whichever platform you use, and send the messages outside? So we have to be able to understand, and we have to accept the power of our, our own power, power of our own power to deconstruct the stereotypes, the power of inclusion instead. How do we develop the power of inclusion? How do we boost the power of inclusion? So I ask you to be mindful of the messages you share, emojis you use, the images you broadcast, the jokes you repost, but I also remind you of the silence that you use. If you do not react, it is not about what I say, but it is also what I don't say when I do not say. So this is not just a matter of accountability of private sector, let's be clear. This is matter, or unstereotype alliance members, this is matter of accountability and personal role and responsibility we all have to achieve. Those human rights that were declared on 10th of December when Alina was born. So we'll celebrate that, I mean, I remember that. And finally, I want to let you go for lunch. I wouldn't stay between you and lunch. I know we've had, it, we've had a lot today. But I want to thank you, really, uh, and I want to close the plenary session by thanking everybody who has joined us today, by colleagues, partners, and guests, my team for doing this amazing work and bringing us all here. And we are particularly grateful to those of you who traveled great distances and those of you who are joining us via web webcast and, and through the YouTube channel. Uh, and those, particularly those who stood in the cold this morning in front of the UN to go through this security that was referred a little bit earlier uh, today. So on behalf of UN Women and Unstereotype Alliance Secretariat, thank you for all of your support and interest. Um, I wish you have a great lunch. I will see you. I will be here all these two days. And please, let's, let's go and get this. and Let's change this statistic for 200-something years and let's create equal world much earlier for all of us. Thank you so much. And with that, this concludes our morning plenary session, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those who need to exit, you can exit at the top uh, of the stairs here on the third floor, and the ushers will guide you down to the public lobby. And of course, for our members, we invite you up to the fourth floor uh, for lunch. Our streaming audience was able to hear but not see that initial Conversations for Change that we played earlier. I'm going to play it again now so we can have you have the opportunity for those of you who are tuning in uh, to see that and to hear that, but of course, everybody feel free to exit and members go up to lunch. Thank you again, everybody, once again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Advertising has a role in impacting cultural change, and 
advertising is very much a microcosm of the stories out there in the real world. And so having inclusion and representation at the heart of that is important in how we see those stories and how we tell those stories. When I talk about what it's like to be from a minority group in terms of lived experiences, I think it's just that feeling that you don't fit in. Even if we just look at the media, 59% um, of articles that are about Muslims are negative. Advertising has a role in impacting cultural change and advertising is very much a microcosm of the stories out there in the real world. And so having inclusion and representation at the heart of that is important in how we see those stories and how we tell those stories. When I talk about what it's like to be from a minority group in terms of lived experiences, I think it's just that feeling that you don't fit in. Even if we just look at the media, 59% um, of articles that are about Muslims are negative. Over a third misrepresent or are stereotyped. And I think that constant messaging slowly can almost make you feel like the parts of you that make you you are things that you should be hide. I went and got my hair cut number one all the way around, so I shaved my head. When they thought that I was a boy, nobody said that I couldn't play football. Nobody questioned how good I was. I was pretending to be something I wasn't, but I felt much more at home. I felt part of the team. I first remember sort of experiencing racism when I was about five or six, and my family moved to a new area, um, and bricks were thrown through our window because people didn't like the fact that we were a black family moving into a white area. My best friend, she was buying makeup, and I inquired what choice is there for me, and the shop assistant said that, I'm sorry, uh, madam, we only stock normal colours. The first time that I became really aware of that we needed better representation in advertising was working as a, a junior creative on a social campaign. And I put forward a, an LGBT couple, two, two females, to be part of this campaign. The next morning, we came into a, a meeting with my MD and CEO, and they said that the client was really angry. They hadn't realized we'd put an LGBT couple forward. It really hit me straight in their heart. I can't believe that they'll allow me to create all their work, but to be part of their work, or be in front of that work, um, they just didn't want it there. I would be left off pitch teams. Even if I'd worked on the pitch behind the scenes, I would be left off pitch teams because um, the agencies I worked for at the time didn't want to give the client the wrong impression, whatever that looked like. I just knew that at times I had a bit of a, a bit of a block towards me. Something needs to change, representation needs to be out there and it needs to be a positive thing for brands. I think for me, I was always conscious of the need for better representation in advertising because I never saw myself on screen. And for that reason, I, I felt like I could never also be that woman that would be on the front of a beauty campaign. I never felt like I could be on the front of like Vogue because I never saw that. And I think that definitely impacted how I felt about myself. That's the definition of beauty that you grow up with. And if you can't you know, if that doesn't reflect you, then what that says to you is, is that you're not beautiful. You need to see yourself in the advert you're consuming. If you can't see it, you can't be it. There is a lot of lazy, unfounded, untruth and stereotypes and associations that are um, accredited to uh, minority groups. Like overly camp representations of gay men, like we saw James Corden doing prom, or um, there's some other ads that have been over time where the camp person is the annoying one or the irritating one. Being perverted, sexually irresponsible, like there's a real kind of sexual stigma that exists around uh, LGBTQ plus people. You think of Islam, and a lot of the things that you think about, thanks to the media, is 
It's a bummer. People like me and groups like me, we're treated as imposters um, within structures, within systems. And so that has a knock-on effect to then how you see yourself and also how other groups see you. Black females are aggressive. That's a very, very lazy trope um, and very, very harmful. And what it discounts is adversity, the power of adversity, the fact that black women have actually had a lot on their shoulders for a very long time and had to still keep it going. And that power of adversity is something that women, black women, can tap into and create into something remarkable. But because of the stereotypes, it dismisses all of that, and that means innovation is lost. People withdraw because they feel exhausted of having to fight those stereotypes again and again and again. It's like um, tiny little paper cuts over and over again on your, on your identity. And I think that constant messaging to a person, regardless of how confident they are in their identity, slowly can chip away. It's almost like waves chipping at a shoreline. When did I feel truly represented in advertising? I don't think I've ever have, actually. I think every now and again you see glimpses. You see glimpses of um, the kind of sense of humour, the kind of personalities that I know is out there. I do see now a lot more people of colour um, on the telly now and within ads. Um, I get the feeling now it's been, you know, let's get more of them on the screen. The danger is that as, ab as advertisers, we actually start following trends and doing like trendy, picking trendy communities. I think the LGBT community was certainly a trendy one. And now we're seeing people picking up um, the black community, which is great and essential, but we also need to think why and how. It would always be a South Asian woman who's either been forced into marriage or who's desperate to get married or comes from a family which um, the only thing that they can see for that woman is marriage and having a family. And my family didn't necessarily push that onto me. Um, they always encouraged me to go out and be independent and make a career for myself. And I never saw that on TV. Disabled people when we don't see ourselves represented in a positive light, when we only see us as victims or being portrayed as people who are suffering or don't want to live a joyous life, we internalise that and then we start to believe that as well. Are we just showing one type of person within those communities? Drag, although a really great and celebratory part of our communities, become a trend. We've seen it in bank ads, we've seen it in car ads, we've seen it in every different type of ad, but we haven't seen anything else. We want to portray South Asian women as being independent. We want to celebrate them as whole individuals, as kind of multi-dimensional individuals. And I think that's often missing from campaigns. We need to show that breadth. And actually, LGBT people from all, all communities do everything that we that anyone else does, but we don't show that. So I think that's what we need to start doing to sort of making more progressive and representation. I felt truly represented when I saw m my family looking back at me. I think having a six-year-old, being a gay man, you don't often see that reflected back. I think we've started to see little bits of representation out there, more so for actually gay parents, gay male parents, than any other part of the community. Um, but I remember seeing an ad, I think it was in the Canes, where two guys were opening the, the, the oven and there was a baby there. And I was like, oh my God, that's my family. Um, and more so that my child's there and she can see her family as well. Childlines Understand Me campaign, which we got involved in as well uh, back in 2018, was about tackling uh, discrimination and hate crimes towards children from different ethnic minority backgrounds. I guess the, the reason I really liked about it was I saw myself in it, in the sense of a Muslim boy with a traditional attire, with a backpack, being treated as a sort of terrorist with a bomb. And I'd been in that situation. Uh, and I love the fact that a brand tackled that, and they tackled it in a way that they believed in us in what we do versus uh, challenging what we were trying to do. Something that had a really big impact on me was seeing how the children reacted to the, the FIFA game. Once the women were in the, that FIFA game, then all the children were talking about it. FIFA had given them that platform and that they deserved a place uh, to be looked at in the same light as, as the male players. So once you create a game like that to children, it kind of normalizes Football is a game for everybody. It doesn't matter what gender you are.
representation means seeing myself celebrated even just for a moment on screen. Uh, so to see the work that we were able to create with the Amazon ad, an intergenerational conversation between two black women through the lens of kindness, to this day is really powerful, still makes me cry. Something I can proudly tell my family that I was a part of, but I know for other black women who look like me, it was a moment we'll never forget. I think the best way to avoid stereotypes... Um... Often we use this phrase, people like to consult, or oh, we consulted with this organisation, that organisation, we consulted with this community. It needs to go beyond consultation and, and involve and embed those communities in your decision making at every level. And my final bit of advice would be to challenge your agencies on this stuff and don't give up. Don't accept, oh, we only ever work with these partners or we don't have the budget or our budget needs to go here. Um, I feel strongly that it's brands that need to lead the charge and that means holding your agencies to accountable because I, I genuinely believe that, you know, the industry is, is sort of ready and needs to do this. They're just looking for brands to lead and brands need to lead in this space. I think it's so important, you know, inside of our own organisations that we do lots in order to make people, our colleagues feel like they can be them, but also that we use the power of our craft to make people outside of our organisations, society, feel like they can be them as well.